The Social Suite is an environmental, social, and corporate governance reporting platform, ESG. We're proud to be supporters of the RIU conference. And I'd firstly like to start by congratulating Social Suite customers that are here presenting throughout the duration of the conference. Black Canyon, Coda Minerals, Gallon Lithium, Galileo Mining, Helix Resources, International Graphite, and Nordic Nickel. These companies, along with 80 ASX micro to small caps, understand the importance of ESG to create long-term organizational value. The Social Suite platform is specifically designed for micro to small caps in supporting them, one, to attract capital from investors that value ESG disclosures, two, creating revenue through responding to supply chain requests and the negotiation of offtake agreements. Three, mitigating organizational risks while building brand value. The Social Suite platform is easy and affordable for the smallest of organizations to get started with ESG. This is complemented by our industry expert ESG coaches who will help you with your ESG journey. We wish all companies and investors a successful RIU conference, and we're here to help with your ESG needs. Well, good morning to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to what we lovingly refer to as the third and final day. Isn't that some screen? You got to look at it three times to see it all. 
And uh, you can see uh, how good it is when you see that uh, presentation, that opening uh, presentation. Well, um, we are at the third and final day of uh, the, the conference, and it's been a huge conference, biggest crowds to date, lots of great stories, uh, great optimism among the, uh, the exhibitors and the delegates, and uh, we are kicking ours, I think is probably the best way to put it, to use a technical term. Let's kick off with our first presentation, important considerations to improve your lithium exploration success. Ian Stockton is an associate partner with CSA Global, an ERM group company, and a geologist with more than 30 years experience in the mineral exploration industry. Ian manages the APAC geoscience team and has worked extensively in Australia, Indonesia, Philippines, Serbia, and Suriname leading exploration teams in multiple commodities, including lithium, gold, copper, nickel, cobalt, and other commodities. Please welcome the well-traveled Ian Stockton. Thanks for the introduction and thanks everybody for attending this morning for the third and final. Um, look, today I'll be um, touching on the important considerations to improve your lithium exploration targeting uh, based on the CSA experience. Um, we're covering really not just the last few years uh, of intense exploration, you know, which we've all seen, um, but the team has decades of experience. And that's not moving. So today I'm really presenting on behalf of a very talented colleagues listed here. Um, they've been very busy uh, assisting clients exploring for LCT pegmatites. Uh, looking at a special mention to Ralph Porter sitting up in there in the middle, who really assisted with this presentation. Uh, Ralph has a deep experience with a 20 years lithium experience. So look, exploration for lithium has dramatically increased in recent years with the move to electrification. Uh, and demand for lithium ion batteries. There's lithium supply and exploration challenges. So, like, kind of, unlike other battery metals, lithium has re limited recyclable resources. Um, we cannot recycle our way out of the shortage. Uh, lithium mines are limited, production is constrained, unlike many of the other battery metals. Existing lithium production is limited to a few mines that previously produced speciality metals, and therefore lithium production needs to catch up with current demand, which can only happen through exploration. The exploration boom for LCT pegmatites, uh, we believe is different uh, to other booms as the knowledge base is new to the broad exploration community. Therefore, the learning curve for the geologists in the field is steeper, which is also quite exciting. Still, you know, time is off the essence. Everyone's at a pump. Uh, we need to understand whether our project is a discovery or barren pegmatites to allow us to move on to the next project in the portfolio in the most efficient way possible. This presentation looks at the critical considerations for exploring for LCT pegmatites focusing on Western Australia and based on the CSA global experience. So on this map, which will be familiar to most of us, it shows the terrains where lithium projects are hosted and the most exploration is undertaken. Well, it's the Archean terrains. The Archean terrains in WA are clearly highly prospective with some of the world's largest lithium bearing pegmatite deposits. Although we're starting to see a wider geographic spread in the Yilgarn associated with some of the relatively thin pegmatites and some proterozoic belts such as the Gascoigne region are demonstrating potentially economic LCT deposits. So what is a pegmatite um, and how do they form? So the, the definition of a pegmatite according to London 2008 uh, is an igneous rock, mostly of granitic composition, and distinguished from other igneous rocks by 
an abundance of crystals was skeletal, uh, graphic, and other strongly directional growth habits, and or a prominent zonation of mineral assemblages. Any one of these textual attributes might be sufficient to define a pegmatite. Um, they tend to occur together. And the general model for pegmatite formation is the crystallization of late stage melts that evolve from a parent magma. So the expiration considerations. You know, expiration for pegmatites is challenging as not all pegmatites fields are mineralized for lithium. And even if they are, it does not mean they'll be exploitable. Fertile granites are a requirement and these include the peroluminous to metaluminous uh, granite rocks, which are mainly Monza granites. Intrusion in placement is typically at depths of seven to eight kilometers. And they may be located below you or in other tenements nearby, but they do need to be nearby. Pegmatites from a common granite source rarely occur alone, but occur in groups that are typically zoned. Starting from simple pegmatites close to the source granite to more distal fractionated and mineralized pegmatites. The host rocks are often upper green schist to amphibolite metamorphic grade. It is therefore important to understand early on in the exploration program where you might be in the overall granite pegmatite mineral system. So starting with the source rocks. These are typically late orogenic fractionated metaluminous to peroluminous granites, montanites, and probably form as mid-crustal melts, although their other exotic source granites may also have similar compositions. Their fractionation state is indicated by a range of whole rock geochemical indices. A source granite, depending on exposure level, may be recognised by the presence of two micas, muscovite and bitite, and garnet and the presence of lithium micas and or tourmaline. The source rocks for granite melt is reflected in the rare element content in the pegmatites. The host rocks and the role of structure. In general, our observation in WA is that greenstone belts are better hosts than granites and gneiss due to greater permeability. In granites and gneisses, pegmatite melt is forced to disperse through a myriad of fractures, resulting in numerous small pegmatites, which can be uneconomic. Host rock temperatures at the time of melt generation is also important as it impacts on how far the fractionated pegmatite melt can move away from the source granite. And this impacts the location of the Goldilocks zones. We'll be more on fairy tales later. The size of the source granite, and hence the volume of evolved fractionated melt, also has a significant impact on developing mineralized pegmatites. Structural preparation has a significant impact on whether pegmatite melt can form large pegmatites. And host rock porosity can impact on how far lithium and other elements may leak out of the pegmatites. So the Goldilocks zone, a fairy tale or just misunderstood? It's a great buzzword, not too hot, not too cold, just right. The distance of the Goldilocks zone from a source granite is largely dependent on a number of factors, including volume of source melt, content of source melt, host rock temperature, and structural permeability. 3D architecture is important. Are you above? Are you to the side? And the structure is critical. Are they permissive or tight? It isn't bad to look at buffer zones around fertile intrusions as a starting point, but if you're above a fertile granite, you will not see it. So keep an open mind and build the mineral system. So pegmatites do come in all shapes and sizes. They can occur over large areas of several square kilometers. They comprise multiple pegmatite bodies with strong structural controls on their size, shape, and distribution. Pegmatite bodies can vary dramatically in size and shape. There are a variety of pegmatite types in a group, 
They can be barren to mineralized, small to large, strongly zoned to weakly zoned. And small pegmatites can hide large deposits. Uh, Mount, Mar Mount Marion, Kathleen Valley, cropped out as thin, moderately dipping uh, sills that overlay large pegmatites at depth. So geochemistry for lithium exploration. This is an interesting topic. Um, I guess mostly aware that using lithium analytical values as an indicator of pigmentite mineralization, you know, it potentially has several complications. Uh, lithium is highly mobile, easily weathered, and leached out of outcropping spodumene and other luminosilicates. Lithium substitutes readily into muscovite species with a progressive increase from lithium muscovite up to 3.75% Li2O to lipidolite 7.26% Li2O, and similarly into biotite, so zimbaldite. There are over 100 lithium minerals that host, uh, minerals that host lithium. Obviously, you don't need to know them all. So barren versus mineralized pegmatites. So barren pegmatites and zone mineralized pegmatites uh, pretty much look the same if the inner zones are not exposed or some key minerals such as beryl or tourmaline are not visible. So how do you determine which is which? Um, and there are a number of different ratios in key minerals such as muscovite, k feldspar, garnet, columbite, tantalum that can provide fractionation information. In our experience, the fractionation state of block EK feldspar using the potassium rubidium ratio um, is fairly robust, robust in terms of identifying potentially mineralized pegmatites. However, care must be taken in collecting a, a clean sample without potassium contamination. In addition, if required, the absolute rubidium value can be used as an indicator proxy uh, if there are issues with K content, but it's probably not preferred. Um, but also beware, um, pegmatites are very common. In your tenement, less than 5% of your pegmatites may contain minerals of interest, and less of these may be large enough to exploit. So therefore, it's important to quickly and accurately target only the most prospective pegmatites. Expression tools and techniques. So detailed aerial imagery is very useful to locate outcropping pegmatites as they're quite resistive, particularly the silica-rich core zones. Larger pegmatites may show as magnetic lows, whether they're outcropping or not, and if outcropping will then also have a potassium radiometric signature. Geological mapping and identification of source granites, if possible, and identification of suitable host rocks is important. Geological mapping should include collecting samples for chemical and mineralogical uh, characterization to help establish the pigment type type and fractionation state. Handheld devices such as portable XRD are great, but a PXRF is also useful for collecting key ratio information if your budget doesn't extend that far. Using the fractionation state and mineralogy of the pegmatites to vector to mineralize pegmatites, and a good structure interpretation is essential. With soil and auger geochemistry as exploration tools, they need to be carefully considered. If you cannot see pegmatite outcrops, then reconsider your objectives as mineralized pegmatites have limited geochemical dispersion halos and lithium values may be related to other sources, such as micas and clays, which can result in false positives. Um, elements such as uh, rubidium, cesium, tantalum, and niobium can be used as um, proxies for lithium to assist in um, interpreting geochemistry. So some takeaway thoughts. Um, exploring for pegmatites is not straightforward. Uh, we need to develop an understanding of the source granites and host rocks. Uh, identifying the granite source rock requires, if possible, investigation of the intrusive mineralogy and geochemistry. Garnets and two mica uh, granites 
can be helpful indicators. High grade metamorphic rocks, upper green schister amphibolite, uh, proximal to major regional shear zones are fertile hunting grounds. So um, Pilgangora, green bushes, Mount Marion, Kathleen Valley, Manor are all examples. Um, granite, granite nice hosted pegmatites tend to be thinner and discontinuous due to the tight host rock, though worldwide there are some exceptions. Um, develop an understanding of the mineral system in 3D. Understand where you are in a pegmatite mineral system um, using key minerals and key fractionation data. Lithium is not a good geochemical tool on its own due to its mobility. Several host rock minerals and lithium readily substituting into micro species. So mineral identification is important. Understand and developing geochemical ratios such as the potassium, potassium rubidium and or rubidium as a proxy. Fractionation is relatively simple but effective approach. And finally, there's no substitute for time on the ground, mapping and classifying pegmatites. And that's just a little bit about me and CSA Global and ERM. And feel, feel, feel free to reach out anytime with any questions. And I guess just finally, we'll have, uh, we've got a pop out booth out in the middle area there. Um, some of the CSA team, myself, Ralph Porter, and others will be there during the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> Nexus Minerals is continuing to develop its Walbrook Gold project here in Western Australia while advancing its porphyry copper gold project in Bathanga, Victoria. Adam James is exploration manager with Nexus Minerals, and he joins us now. Please make him welcome, Adam James. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here presenting again at RIU. It's been a huge 12 months for Nexus Minerals, and um, it, I'm really looking forward to taking you through a company update. So looking at the um, corporate overview here, um, we've currently got 325 million shares on issue. Uh, the current share price, 21 cents for a market cap, quite respectable, around 68 million. Uh, 7 million in cash on hand, so well-funded. Um, and our top 20 shareholders holding around 28% of the company. Uh, Northern Star holding around just under 5% of that. Board and management team, they bring uh, well over 100 years of uh, corporate management and technical experience. So a strong and well-regarded team to push the project and the company forwards. So looking at our, our projects, uh, two main areas uh, right here in Western Australia, um, our Eastern Goldfields projects, Warbrook in particular, our flagship, um, that's been the main focus of the last 12 months. And we also have our Bathanga project over in Victoria, where we're, we're on the hunt for uh, large copper copper gold porphyries. So that one's much more grassroots, and I'll, I'll just touch on that at the end of the presentation. So the Walbrook Gold Project um, in Eastern Goldfields, um, around 140 k's uh, northeast of Kalgoorlie. And you can see here, when it comes to location, it, it's, it's really um, um, pretty well placed. We are situated between uh, Karasu Dam operations, the Karari mine to the south, and then the Porphyry mine as well. So Northern Star are currently in mining at Porphyry Underground and uh, the Million Dollar Open Pit, and they uh, they truck their ore straight past our doorstep down to the Karasu Dam mill. And it really is astounding. We've got 250 kilometers square of exploration tenure there, 50 kilometers prospective strike. And despite the proximity to existing operations, um, really uh, an underexplored package of ground. So when we're doing our exploration there, we can just about hear the trucks in the open pit and watch the road trains going past our doorstep. So great, great location. And when it comes to the, uh, the geological side, um, really this project has the three ingredients that makes uh, a great, great exploration project and a great, great project. So, We've got the significant and large alteration footprint. We've got some big structure going through the project. And then we've got neurology to the, uh, to the existing deposits in the area. 
And really, um, this project has had a good deal of success for us so far. Uh, people familiar already will, uh, will know about our Crusader Templar discovery. Uh, that was in 2021, and we did a, a lot of work there last year. Um, the MRE is due out at uh, the end of this quarter this year. Um, and last year, we also made the branches discovery as well. A lot of the regional effort, we've got five mineralized corridors there. Um, and as I said, highly underexplored. And what we found now, rather than being a single discovery on the project, um, with, with the work that we've done, the discoveries we've got, the exploration, exploration success we've got, in addition to the surrounding deposits, we're looking at a gold camp here. So really looking at the broader potential of the project and, and what it can deliver for us and our shareholders. So with the exploration we've done and a good deal of work, um, we've got a pretty good idea of the, uh, the vectoring strategies on the project, uh, the geophysical uh, methods utilized, the gravity and the ground mag. Um, we've done some uh, surveys over the core area of focus on the, on the project. And we're, um, we're in a position now really to, to push forwards with uh, uh, soils drill testing and, and working up the, uh, the pipeline of projects uh, behind obviously Crusader and Templar. So with such great potential, obviously, we want to have a, a systematic exploration approach. So here we've got the exploration triangle that you may or may not be familiar with. At the bottom, we've got project generation. And as I said, we've got the three ingredients, big structure, big alteration footprint, and neurology to other economic deposits. So we're calling this the right rocks, and that's certainly what Walbrook's got. Moving through, so we jump up to geological anomalies. As I said, we've got five mineralized corridors there. Uh, the most advanced geological anomaly on that, 3.2, we've recently completed a soil survey on. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but an, an exciting target. Moving up um, to exploration targets where we're rolling the drill rigs. Uh, target 4.1, really exciting results out for that last week. Again, I'll touch on that a little bit later. Branches prospect, that discovery last year. Uh, now 1.1 kilometers of strike length. Um, so certainly following the footsteps of Crusader Templar. And there it is um, in resource definition stage, uh, MRE due out at the end of this quarter. And at the top of the triangle there, we've got monetization. So what we're doing as we go through and we systematically approach this, uh, the, the targets, the best targets are working the way up that triangle. Uh, so tar target 3.2, now ready for air core drill testing. Target 4.1, we want to get an RC rig onto that as soon as possible. And then obviously Crusader Templar, MRE due out, end of this, end of this quarter, and really starting to think about what options have we got for monetization. So an exciting time for sure for the company. So I'll just take you through the uh, the main the main uh, areas we've been focusing on over the last 12 months. Uh, Crusader Templar, as I said, the uh, certainly the flagship on the project at the moment. Um, We've got 1.6 kilometers of strike length uh, there um, and on 100% own and granted um, MLs. So, you know, a significant advantage in terms of permitting time, all the rest of it, the well, discovered ounces can be quickly developed. As I said, we did a significant drill campaign last year with um, RC and Diamond. Um, as part of that, we did uh, some metallurgical test work and couldn't have hoped for better results, really. 98% recoveries in the oxide, 97.6 in the fresh rock, um, a big green tick for the project. Flora and fauna surveys completed, and again, no issues raised, and that MRE due out at the end of this quarter. And just to give you an idea of the kind of intercepts we've had from here and uh, also sort of the broader potential on the project as well, um, some examples there, 13 metres at 3.63 within 84 at 1.35, 20 metres at 4.6 within 33 at 2.96, some fantastic intercepts there. And, and really, I suppose, getting us excited about not only Crusader Templar, but the broader prospectivity. Now, with all the work we've done at Crusader Templar, we've been able to develop a, a pretty strong geological model and a geological framework for the deposit. And um, here's, uh, here's a sort of simplified uh, section um, through Crusader Templar, where we've got this sort of folded architecture and um, uh, the deep structures that are sort of bringing in those, those fluids. And uh, again, we're calling these the, the right rocks. So 
with this framework we've been able to develop, um, what we're able to do is apply it regionally and uh, and sort of uh, improve our exploration approach over the broader project and improve our uh, discovery costs. And certainly when we apply that model to branches, you can see here the same folded architecture. We've recently completed a drill program there, again, results out last week, and we've actually been able to double the strike length of this project, this, this prospect. Uh, the, the results we've got again, uh, five meters at 17.91 within eight at 11.37, five at 5.45 within 36 at 2.04. Not numbers you can get bored of, that's for sure, and, and really speaking to the broader potential. So what we'd like to be able to do at this stage, uh, branches is really ready for more of the res death star work and basically follow in the footsteps of Crusader Templar. And really that pipeline's really building on the project. Looking at target 4.1, so um, this is jumping across onto, a, onto another mineralized corridor, mineralized corridor four. Um, and here we've just completed an air core drill program. Uh, and what's particularly exciting about this, uh, we've got this gold and multi-element anomaly, uh, some 1.7 kilometers long. Uh, the results we've got from here, eight at four within 21 at 1.69, four at 2.58 within nine at 1.49. These results are reflective of the results we had when we discovered Templar. So very similar results in terms of the, the Templar discovery holes. So really excited about this. Uh, the, the main difference between this and Templar, the footprint of this anomaly is bigger. So we're really excited uh, with the potential of this and the, the idea of getting the RC rig onto this um, as soon as possible. So looking, uh, looking more regionally, uh, as I said, um, five mineralized corridors identified to date. Uh, we're really trying to demonstrate this systematic exploration approach where we're advancing uh, projects up that triangle uh, to generate value on the project. The most recent one of those uh, anomalies, um, one of the first to be tested, we've run a soil program across anomaly 3.2. Um, and we've identified a, a one kilometer by 0.7 kilometer plus 0.1 ppm soil anomaly. Um, this, this prospect, this, this is located in the same corridor as a historically mined Margaret deposit that, that Northern Star currently owns. So um, in terms of the potential of the anomaly, um, it is certainly in, in, in a good area. And when it comes to the targeting methodology we've used to identify this, um, the, the vectoring approach um, in our minds is being validated, which is fantastic for the, the broader exploration team as well. And, and um, certainly we hope to replicate this. So I'll leave um, Warbrook there for now. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of good news to come from this. Uh, a lot of good news to uh, to come from this, um, and I'll jump across to our uh, Bethanga project um, over in um, over in Victoria. Uh, the Bethanga project um, is in one of um, Australia's premier geological terrains. Um, so we've got, uh, I think, North Parks, uh, 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 Cadia Ridgeway, the same geological terrain that ho hosts those big porphyry deposits. And uh, I suppose what's got us interested here, um, there's existing um, sort of historically mined areas on this project, uh, but it's not really adding up. The metal isn't where we're expecting it to be. And the big question here is, is there a bigger source, a porphyry source here? So what we're doing here is we're doing a porphyry assessment, uh, a fertility assessment. Uh, you can see here a suite of, um, of uh, sort of initial exploration targeting tools done to date. Um, that porphyry assessment uh, study um, is, uh, is due out this quarter. So looking at our planned exploration activities, um, first and foremost, obviously, that MRE due out uh, Q1, end of Q1. Um, we are keen to get the RC rig onto branches and again, begin that sort of res death style work, bring it up behind Crusader Templar and, and keep that pipeline growing. Target 4.1, seriously exciting. Um, mirroring Templar at the moment in terms of the discovery holes, we want to get an RC rig onto this as soon as possible. Uh, more regionally, um, air core drilling we'll be doing across uh, target 3.2 and broader soils start working on again, building that pipeline. Over in Bathanga, uh, that porphyry fertility assessment uh, due out uh, this quarter. And that's really going to dictate the next steps on that project. 
So in summary, um, highly prospective land holding here in WA, we're building gold camp scale potential on this project. Uh, discovery in 2021 with Crusader and Templar, discovery in 2022 with branches. We're really excited about what we could do in 2023. Over in Victoria, that fertility study due out this quarter. Well funded, great management team, strong exploration team. Thank you very much. Alan Kelly is a geologist, geochemist, and manager with close to 30 years experience in mineral exploration, development and production throughout Australia and the Americas. He was the founding MD of Dore Minerals and discovered the high-grade Wilbur Lode gold deposit within the Andy Wells project. In 2014, Alan was awarded the AMEC Prospector Award He's now executive chairman of Miramar Resources, which listed in October of 2020 and has outlined a potential camp scale gold discovery at its Gigi JV project and a large scale high grade gold footprint at its Glendor project. Please welcome Alan Kelly. Great. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Jerry, and good to see you back up the front. Um, I'm going to give you a quick run through on our activities uh, over the last sort of 12 months at Miramar. Um, we're a new company. We've only been around a couple of years. I think we were the first company to list after COVID lockdown. Um, so it's been a pretty exciting couple of years. Okay, um, we're active, diversified WA Explorer. Our focus is in, in WA. We've got a number of projects um, and, and the presentation today, I'll actually start from the north and head down to the south and finish in the gold fields. We've got a really interesting developing project at Whale Shark, where we think there's an opportunity for a large iron oxide copper gold deposit, uh, a strategic land position in the Bangamore. Uh, as Jerry said, we think we've got an opportunity for a new gold camp at Gidgee, just on the outskirts of Kalgoorlie. And we've also got some uh, rare, rare earth potential at our Langwell project in the Murchison and also at our land position in the Bangamore. Um, a bit different for a small team, we've actually got experience in finding and building and operating things. So obviously that's key to be able to recognise opportunities. And I think, uh, you know, at a current market cap of $5 million, I think we've got unmatched uh, share price leverage to a, an exploration uh, discovery. <clears throat> So this is our Gascoigne region footprint. Uh, we've got a number of projects up there in the Proterozoic uh, Capricorn origin. And as I said, I'll talk about whale shark uh, a bit more than I, I would normally because it's starting to look pretty interesting up there. Um, whale shark sits off the end of the Proterozoic rocks where it goes under the basin. So it's a little bit sort of underexplored compared to the rest of the Capricorn origin. And then a few years ago, um, before we did the IPO, we picked up a land position in the Bangamore uh, and initially we picked it up to look for Proterozoic Nickel Copper PGEs, uh, the Proterozoic Margin Style PGEs, uh, Nickel Copper PGEs related to the Proterozoic Gollorite Sills. But obviously there's been a lot of uh, exploration success over the last couple of years with people around us making uh, rare earth carbonatite discoveries. So we've sort of been looking at the opportunity for that as well. So Whale Shark's a project that I've been involved with since uh, the mid-90s when I was at Western Mining. Um, and we think there's potential for a, a large iron oxide copper gold discovery, you know, something similar to an Ernest Henry or a Carapatina. Um, and the reason we say that is there's a Proterozoic Biff and Granite complex under the Carnarvon Basin there. Um, compared to something like the Gawler Kraton, you've only got sort of 80 to 100 metres of cover, so it's a lot easier to explore. Uh, we went out... Uh, 2021 and did some MMI soil sampling, got some really nice copper, gold, silver, uranium, moly anomalies that sat sort of around the edge of that granite. And then last year we got an air core rig out and did some what we call interface drilling, where we're just drilling down to the top of the unconformity and sampling. And we got a couple of really nice um, copper, gold, silver anomalies at that interface. And, and one of the really interesting things is that uh, fortunately for us, um, University of Queensland have, have put together a deposit atlas on a number of deposits, including Ernest Henry and E1 and Stara and Eloise. And so there's a really good library of lots and lots of data sets of what these deposits look like. 
And for, on the right hand side, there is a schematic uh, diagram what Ernest Henry looks like. And there's a very strong geochemical anomaly that sits at that unconformity between the, the sort of overlying sediments in the basement. So we use that as our sort of tool to, to explore at whale shark. And we've got some really nice uh, numbers which were comparable uh, with what you see at Ernest Henry. Um, we put out some numbers on Wednesday, including some sort of major element data, so things like sodium and potassium and that. And they also show that along with the geochemistry, we're getting the same sort of alteration that you would see at uh, Ernest Henry and E1 as well. So that, you know, a couple of ingredients that like that, that make us uh, very excited in the opportunity at Whale Shark. Now, I don't know how well you can see it, but the outline of the granite there is shown in, in red within the, uh, the BIF, and this is a, a gravity image. And in the neck of that granite, there's a little a gravity anomaly that's about sort of half a kilometre by 750 metres long. So, um, you know, our best copper numbers are sort of centred on that little gravity anomaly. Uh, and you can see there's some gold sort of in the structure there as well. You know, 0.1 gram gold in the middle of a granite in the middle of nowhere is pretty exciting too. Um, looking through data for these sort of deposits, uh, I found some other interesting information on some work that people did in South Australia. Well, I've done a, a fair bit of ISCG exploration myself. Um, so they looked at the signatures at Prominent Hill at Carapatina, uh, and typically with these ISCG deposits, they have a lot of rare earths with them as well. So they looked at where the rare earths were within the deposit, and it was mostly hosting monazite grains within the deposit. And it was a special sort of signature, characteristic signature of high lanthanum and cerium and low yttrium and thorium. And they said, well, does that, does that signature cover, you know, go into the sediments above the deposit and can we use that as a vector? Um, and the answer to that was yes, that you could see the monazite grains within the sediments and they had the same sort of geochemical signature. So the next step from that was, can we just assay the sediments rather than the actual monazite grains and see the same thing? And the answer to that is yes as well. So when you, you plot up lanthanum and cerium and against yttrium, there's a, sort of a field of of numbers here, which you know they think it's related to ICGs, and when we did the same thing for whale shark, we got the same sort of signature there. So we're seeing geochem, we're seeing alteration um, in a number of aspects, and and the, the key now is to to get the bedrock um, get bedrock mineralisation um, identified. So this is what we know so far about whale shark. Um, that picture on the right is a typical air core hole. Uh, we've got sort of about 60 to 80 metres of Cretaceous mudstone sitting over the top of basement. So it's, it's pretty shallow. We can drill it with air core pretty easily. Um, we've got the Protozoic granite intrusion, which is the right sort of age uh, to what you'd expect to see. We've got some iron rich rocks nearby. Um, we've got strongly anomalous geochemistry. We've got alteration and we've got a gravity anomaly as well. So the next steps here uh, this year, we want to do a more comprehensive heritage survey, probably some geophysics and continue that air core drilling to help refine the target and then follow that up with some deeper diamond drilling. Uh, Langwell, a little project that we've got in the Murchison, it sits in between Deflector and Golden Grove. It's an underexplored sort of high metamorphic grade granite nice strain out there. Uh, hasn't had a lot of work, but the work that was done there was pretty interesting. There were some large uh, auger anomalies that were done uh, by a company back in 2009. For some reason, they assayed for samarium. I'm not sure why, but um, they got the large gold and samarium anomalies. Um, the other thing, just following on from what um, Ian was saying, there's some very large linear potassium anomalies that you see in the radiometrics. So we thought there's potential for quite a lot of pegmatites here. Um, the limited amount of air core drilling that was done in 2010 had some pretty elevated lanthanum and cerium numbers, but uh, they only uh, assayed one sample from one hole for rare earths, and that was four metres at 1,500 ppm total rare earth, so uh, at about 30 metres. So we thought that was pretty interesting. So we've just done a small drilling uh, program there, and the results from that should be coming back in the next couple of weeks. So down to our flagship project at Gigi, uh, just north of Kalgoorlie. Uh, for those that know Kalgoorlie, it's on the road out to Menzies. Um, you can drive past the, the, the two-up school and the speedway just before you get to the Gigi Roaster. That's our project, both sides of the road. So I like to use the real estate analogy and say it's the cheapest house on the best street. 
Uh, we've got the super pit to the south of us. We've got Paddington to the north of us. We've got Canada Bell to the east of us and Kandana to the west. So, and you'd think that being in that location, it would be pretty well explored. Um, but the issue here was that there's about sort of 30 to 40 metres of transported cover. And there's also a paleo channel that runs across the middle of the, the project. So even though, you know, Paddington's been known about, you know, for 40 odd years and the super pits, the deposits have obviously been known about for 100 years. When we got hold of the project, I think there was only about uh, five or six effective drill holes across that entire 15 kilometre strike um, geology. So we set about doing some systematic air core drilling, um, came up with a number of targets, including uh, Marlebone, Black Horizon Highway. And um, we're looking forward to, to turning those sort of air core hits into uh, a bedrock deposit. And we also think this could be a gold camp. We think, you know, given this, the size uh, of the strike length here and the location, there's potential for multiple deposits. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that we've got alongside the gold potential, there's about 15 kilometres of strike of a ultramafic unit called the Highway Ultramafic. And that's the same ultramafic unit that hosts the historic Scotia nickel mine and also the Saints nickel deposit, which Auroch is developing. So we think there's also potential here for uh, Kamadiite hosted nickel on that basal contact of that um, highway ultramafic. So if you just sort of zoom in on the, the central part of the, the project where we've done most of the work, we've done about 900 air core holes so far, about 20 RC holes. And all those reds and pinks, they're all like plus two to five gram hits in air core. We've got some pretty good hits up to sort of 12 and 13 grams, um, shallow and, and just beneath the paleo channel. And, you know, over the last sort of six, 12 months, we, we, we didn't think that people were actually understanding the size and the scale of, of what we've actually um, been drilling here. So we decided to put an exploration target around that Marlebone um, target. Um, just on the shallow sort of supergene and alluvial gold. And, you know, roughly speaking, that's about 100,000 ounces by itself, just within that sort of pink outline. Um, it doesn't include all the other parallel targets at, at Blackfriars and Highway and, and Railway. Um, but, you know, by, that, by itself, you know, we haven't done the economics on it yet, but that's a, you know, significant sort of discovery in that area. And it's very comparable to something like the Panglo deposit, which was about 117,000 ounces and was only ever a super gene deposit. Um, so we're, what we're doing is we're working out, um, you know, bedrock targets for, for deeper testing. Um, this black fries target, this parallel one here, is probably my favourite. Um, it's about it's about 1.2 k's long. It, it's on the mafic. Um, it's on the contact between the mafic rocks and the black flag rocks. So that's actually closest analogy to Paddington. Um, and right at the northern end, uh, we've got a hole that finishes in about 11.7 grams uh, with silver and other things. So, you know, that's a, a pretty significant intersection. And hopefully that leads to some deeper bedrock mineralisation. Uh, so this is what we're looking for. You know, we, we put out the expiration target, but we're out, we're out there looking for a big bedrock uh, deposit, you know, plus million ounce. And this, this is Paddington at the same scale as, as the Marlebone target. Um, it, it's a lot of similarities. The geology is very similar, you know, mafic uh, black flag contact. Uh, but the key is this dolerite, this Paddington dolerite, which is, you know, one of these uh, uh, dolerites that you'd see in the Gold Mile or Junction or out at Lake Row. So, we, you know, we need to find one of these dolerites. Hopefully we find one on that uh, black fries contact. But everything else is very similar. The geology sequence is similar. The structural setting is very similar. The scale is very similar, but we've got multiple parallel um, structures with mineralisation in them. Uh, Glandor, uh, this is a project just 40 k's east of Kalgoorlie. Uh, we drilled this for the first time last year. It's on the lake, so it took a little bit of time to, to free up a lake rig to get out there. Um, the general geology here is that you've got a late granite intruding into a, a, a layered mafic sequence. So again, the dolerites here, I think, are going to be pretty important. Um, there were some historic air, there's a very large air core footprint that stretches over a few kilometres on the lake. And there'd been some limited diamond drilling that had been done by people like Harmony and Anglo Gold Ashanti. And they had hits up to six metres at 30 grams here. And there was these, there's a number of these northeast structures that sort of cut through that contact between the, the granite and the, the sill. 
And right on that sort of contact, we drilled a number of holes. I think we drilled six diamond holes and four of those hit narrow high grade results. Um, I don't know how well you can see the labels, but you know, 0 0.4 at 18 and 0 0.8 at 12 and uh, 0 0.8 at six and then 0.7 at 13. So there's gold there um, on multiple structures. What we want to do is chase those structures into the probably the more um, fertile host rocks, the so things like the dolerites and the, and the gabbros and see if we can uh, increase the size of that uh, mineralisation. Uh, corporate snapshot, uh, tight register. Um, we've only been around a couple of years. Uh, we're at very low EV. That's probably the one thing I want to get across to, to the audience today. Uh, so if we make a discovery, that'll quickly increase. And just to summarise, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of upside for our shareholders from the current market cap in EV. We think we've got a potential for a new gold camp at Kichi, plus or minus nickel. Um, we've got you know a lot of high grade hits there at Glandor that could turn into something pretty quickly. The real company maker would be a, an ICG deposit um, up at Whale Shark. So we're very keen to, to push that along this year to see what that looks like in the bedrock. And there's also some, I guess, some spice to add portfolios, the potential for Barreras in the Bangamore and Langwell. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Alan. Matza Resources is a highly active exploration company advancing the Brownfields Lake Kerry Gold Project here in Western Australia and the Western Granite Lithium Projects in Thailand. The Lake Kerry Gold Project has 800, 886,000 ounces of gold and several high quality exploration targets of between 666,000 ounces to 1.36 million ounces. And their lithium project is developing to be a potentially large multi-deposit lithium story. And these projects underpin the growth potential of the Matza story. Executive Chairman Paul Poli is uh, with us today and he will explain the recent events and outline the near term strategy for the company which is said to deliver superior gains for shareholders. Please welcome Paul Polly. Thank you for that introduction and uh, particularly pleasing to be here this morning. Uh, we've had a little bit of fun with our share price this week. It's up 50%, a little bit of luck that'll continue. Mm -hmm. Company itself, Matza Resources, codes MAT. Uh, we are very proudly boast that we've got just under 900,000 ounces of uh, gold at 2.4 grams per tonne average in Lake Kerry, Western Australia. Um, the board's very experienced and uh, we're really introducing uh, down the bottom there our fifth uh, member of the management team, Ratha Kialghamsiyang. Uh, he's a director of our Thai companies, uh, not a director of our ASX. We are uh, proudly supported by BNR Paribus and Deutsche Balaton, and uh, you'll see that I've got a, a good interest in our company as well, personally. We like to call our company a gold company with a twist of lithium, um, and, and we really are quite serious about that. We are a, a two-pronged company with fantastic gold assets and extremely interesting lithium assets. Uh, as I said, we've got 886,000 ounces of gold at Lake Erie in Western Australia, 500 square kilometres of ground, 240 kilometres northeast, northeast of Kalgoorlie. And in lithium, we've amassed uh, just under 1,200 square kilometres of ground in uh, SPLAs. Uh, they are applications. They've all been accepted by the Thai government. We are now working towards formal granting and drilling consents. Uh, we'll speak about these projects in a little bit more detail shortly. But as I said, we've got a two-pronged attack, and that's our two-pronged strategy. There are three messages I'd like to get across this morning, and uh, I'll explain those three to you. It's a photo of our Lake Kerry project, our Fortitude uh, gold mine. Um, Lake Kerry itself, as I said, 886,000 ounces. We've got two mining studies that have been completed at Lake Kerry. One is the Fortitude gold mine. $95 million positive cash flow at $2,400 Australian gold price. That is a fully permitted gold mine that can be mined today. Second study we completed was a scoping study at the Devon pit, showed $40-odd million in profit. That is under joint venture uh, with our new joint venture 
partners, uh, Linden Gold Alliance, uh, who we're um, advancing that project together with. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Fortitude itself, uh, we did a trial mine there in 2017-18. We mined 10,000 ounces. Uh, we produced about a million dollars profit. That really was the trial for this mine. Um, 132,000 ounces over two and a half years to produce probably close to $100 million positive cash flow. Devon Pitt, as I said, this is part of our joint venture with Linden Gold Alliance. This will make about $40 million. Our share will be about $20 million. We've already received $4 million as a non-refundable, non-repayable uh, prepayment of our share of profit. That hopefully will have a uh, feasibility study completed by August of this year. Financing should be put to uh, bed by our joint venture partners by September of this year. We currently are explore, exploring in Lake Erie, and we think it is a fantastic area to be exploring. We have located 26 gold targets, of which we will systematically explore and hopefully drill them all. You will see this morning that uh, we posted out some, I think, rather impressive drill results. Um, 14 metres at just under 5 grams, 26 metres at 3.2 grams, 11 metres at 4 grams. You can read the rest. This is all open pitable. It's close to surface. The actual extent of the uh, mineralized zone is 1.6 kilometres long. We have drilled to the far north, as you can see in this long section, um, and we didn't expect to find these types of grades. So what this has meant is that it has completely opened up the ground and this mineralized zone to the north. Where we thought we were limited to 1.6, uh, it's going to go well and truly beyond that. You don't get intersections of 19 metres at just under four grams if the ore body is to be shut off. So we'll continue our exploration. We released seven out of the last nine holes um, results today. We've got a drill rig going out there in about four weeks. We are well funded, so we'll continue to explore it, uh, Fortitude North. And I think we will continue to see these types of gold grades. And what we hope to be able to achieve within the next few months, six months or whatever, is a maiden resource at Fortitude. Our target is three to 600,000 ounces. Uh, we think that can easily be achieved with this current drilling. If we achieve that, we will be well north of a million ounces of gold in excess of 2.4 gram average at Lake Kerry. We will then turn our minds, how do we get a processing facility? How do we actually produce from this? But that's not all. As I said, we're a two-prong company. Gold's our first prong. Love it. We think it's high value, fantastic location uh, in WA. But what we're seeing in Thailand with our lithium assets have also got us very excited. Whether we remain one company with two projects or we do something else uh, is yet to be seen. But lithium in Thailand is pretty well much unknown. And I think we're trailblazers. With our fellow ASX company, Pan Asia, I had the pleasure of talking with Paul Locke yesterday. So I think we're, we're both excited about what we have. I do want to discuss this topic. I think it's very important, and I want to try and hammer this home. Thailand has lipidolite, and it has brines. It has no spodumene. How many times in the last couple of months I've been told lipidolite's no good? You can't process it. Well, that's wrong. You can't process lipidolite because it needs too much sulfuric acid. Well, that's wrong. You can't process lipidolite because it costs too much in electricity. That's wrong. Fundamental fact, lipidolite is processable. It is being processed today. So the misconception that lipidolite is difficult or too expensive to process is just false. Four substantial companies are currently processing lipidolite in Yangtze province in southern China. We must look beyond just bodgemine. We're going to demonstrate that to you today. As I said, four producers in Jiangxi province, they mine lipidolite and they process it. And that is 
all that they process. I'll try and say these company names, Yongxing Material, Jiangte Motor, Nanshi Lithium, and few new energy. We are having very close discussions with Yongxi Material. Yongxi Material has got a market cap of 9 billion Australian dollars. 98% of their production comes only from lithium mining and lithium production. And all that they mine is lipidolite. They had sales of $3.2 billion last year. They had a net profit of $1.33 billion Australian. 98% of that is from lipidolite. Interestingly, they, they mined 0.6% lipidolite. Really important numbers. It's really important we understand. Lipidolite is alive and well. China only produces lithium from their mining, from brines and lipidolite. No spodumene. This is the Yangtze in Yangtze province. We're actually going there in the next fortnight. This is their plan. Again, I'll reinforce it. Lipidolite only. They're expanding their operation from 1.2 million tonnes per annum, which produced last year just over 20,000 tonnes of battery-grade lithium carbonate, and they are going to go from 1.2 million tonnes to 3.6 million tonnes. Interestingly, their mineral resource at their mine at 0.6 grams, sorry, 0.6% used to gold, 0.6%, they've only got about 3 million tonnes left. They have to get different sources of lipidolite. That's why they're talking to us. The product you get from lipidolite, battery grade lithium, is comparable, if not the same, as the battery grade lithium you get from spodumene. This is Yonxi's product. You can see the lithium content is actually higher from lipidolite than spodumene. I say to all the naysayers, Lipidolite is valuable. Proof is here. Interestingly, what is lipidolite worth? What is uh, uh, Li2O worth, lithium oxide worth? Well, core lithium sold 15,000 dry tonnes at 1.4% lithium oxide, spodumene lithium oxide, at $951 a tonne US. That's equivalent. For every 1% lithium, $984 Australian. It's big money. Compare that to what you get for a tonne of iron ore. 1% is worth 984. 2%, 4%, what's it worth? Depends what you want, what you got in the ground. Depends the correlation between lipidolite price and spodumene price. Yangtze, sorry, Yongxing are telling us it's comparable pricing. So what have we got in Thailand? I'm running out of time, but I'll run through this as quickly as possible. You've got other ASX companies in Thailand. Thailand is now real for mining. It is now open for mining. Kingsgate's leading the way, and they're showing us that. We have got three mineralized zones. We've got three areas where we found substantial pegmatites that are lithium bearing. Not are they lithium, they are lithium. So at Peng Na, our southern province, We've got 1.77%. This is whole of rock assays. This is not the molecule testing. You're limited in spodumene at 8%, 8.2%. You're limited at 4% for lipidolite. This is whole of rock. So this is the actual product that you'll get, 2.91%, 2.5%, 2.4%. These are very high grades for a DSO product. Remember, 1% spodumene is worth 984 what is 2.3% lipidolite DSO worth? You can do the mathematics. You can see why we're excited. This is one project, Peng Na, a couple of kilometres long, kilometre wide. You can see the area in pink. It is littered with lithium occurrences throughout that pegmatite. We are calling this Rose Panther. We found this by doing stream sediment samples, then walking the ground, and we've seen the outcropping of pegmatites. We have found a second area in Pangna. At this point in time, we're calling it area 18. Found it again, 
by soil and stream sediments. This area is one kilometre long by 800 metres wide. Kanchanaburi. This is a fantastic area. This is 600 kilometres to the north in Thailand. We have followed the granite belt in Western Thailand. We think we have found lithium provinces that previously never been found. Kanchanaburi, this pegmatite, this lithium occurrence area, we believe goes for seven kilometres, two kilometres wide. This is an application that we've lodged with the Thai government. It has been accepted by the Thai government. It is ours. We've bought a Libs analyzer. We're seeing lithium oxide upwards of 7%. We think our whole of rock lithium will be 3.5% or thereabouts. This could be massive. This is what the Kanchanaburi met samples look like. You can see the outcrop. You can see the rocks. We have collected 25 kilogram samples. In fact, we've got four sets of 25 kilogram samples. We have signed an agreement with Yongsing Materials Company, Special Materials Company Limited. These samples are going to their laboratory probably in a couple of weeks' time, and they will do all the metallurgical testing. They will be do, they'll do process testing to see if this works through their mill. They are very keen in what we have. Rachaburi is our third area of lithium. I apologise, but I need to rush. We're seeing 4.5% lithium oxide at Rachaburi. We potentially have three deposits. I think we'll have a lot more. We think we can be drilling in Thailand in May, June of this year. There's not much more to do after that. Thanks for your time today. Certainly been a pleasure. <coughs> Paul Pulley advancing an argument for something I'd never heard of, lapidolite. That's the first time I've pronounced that word. I might have to use it again. With uh, Mount Isa set as one of Australia's hottest copper exploration districts, Hammer Metals is well-placed heading into 2023 with resource in excess of 400,000 tonnes of copper equivalent metal and some 2,000 square kilometres of prime exploration tenure. Dan Thomas will provide you with an insight into Hammer's growing copper inventory and a number of near-field, high-potential exploration targets. Please welcome Dan. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, thanks to Stu and Jackson and the Vertical Events team for what I think is a, an outstanding event. It's a pleasure to be up here and presenting the copper and gold story in Mount Isa for anyone that's new to, to Hammer Metals. Um, have a look at what we've got. We've built a dominant position in the Mount Isa region. I think Australia's uh, hottest copper exploration district, and we've built a, an enviable position of some 2,600 square kilometres there. To put that into perspective, anyone from Perth, jump on the freeway, Yanship, drive down to Mandra, go to the coast and go about 15 kilometres inland, and that is the size of the tenure package that we have in Mount Isa that we're exploring for copper. There's been a number of copper to cut discoveries in this region in the past 12 months. Um, including our own. Um, we have a team that have made world-class mineral discoveries before and we're committed to doing the same. The thing I will draw your attention to, we've got a bit of a head start. We've got some 440,000 tonnes of copper equivalent jork resources already, and that's growing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. In terms of where we sit, we have a market capitalisation of circa 55 to $60 million. Uh, we have 2.6 million in cash at the end of December. We have a, a tax refund coming in of some $1 million. So we're funded for our upcoming activities. Uh, the board and management uh, together hold 13% of the company and uh, the other top 20 uh, shareholders account for roughly the other uh, 37 to 39% of the top 50. Together, we've all been involved in this for some time and we're all committed to making sizable discovery and moving the company from copper explorer to copper to developer. Uh, in terms of myself, just for a bit of background, for five years I worked for Sandfire Resources looking for copper development opportunities around the globe and a couple of things I can pass on. One, there aren't many. Uh, so there is a real shortage of 
copper development opportunities around the world. And when you start looking for copper development opportunities, there are three things in my mind that you want to have. Uh, you want a company that's got a district scale potential and district size potential. And you can see where we sit here, surrounded by tier one and tier two deposits in the Mount Isa region. You know, names you've heard of before, Mount Isa, George Fisher, Ernest Henry, Cannington, we're smack bang in the middle of it in an area that's been forgotten about for decades and is undergoing some sort of renaissance at the moment. So you want that district position. The other thing you want to have, if you want to attract the attention of a major or a mid-tier copper producer, you want to have a project that can be developed with 440,000 tonnes of copper equivalent metal. We're well on our way there. Anyone that's heard me speak before, you know, my, my numbers around this area, I think you need 600,000 tonnes of copper uh, equivalent metal within your portfolio to have a development scenario on your hands to give yourself at least 10 years of production at 30,000 tonnes per annum. I think Hammer is well on its way to achieving that. In particular in the region, I think with the neighbouring uh, success that we've seen, I think this region has that inventory to have a standalone development uh, scenario through here. So it's going to be really interesting to watch that unfold. And the third thing I think any copper developer wants to see is they want to see a 20 to 30 year mine life opportunity. And this district has that potential. This year, Mount Isa celebrates its 100th year in operation. So again, we're treading a path that's well trodden before, albeit in an area that's been forgotten about and hasn't been explored for some time. Our 440,000 tonnes of copper equivalent metal predominantly comes from our Kelman deposit. And our Kelman deposit has been around for the best part of 15 years. Um, it's really interesting when you start looking at it. We really turned our mind to it about 14 months ago. You can see the zones in purple on the screen. Uh, the zones in purple are unclassified material that sat outside of our resource calculation, but sat there as potential to add straight into our resource. Last year, we, we embarked on a program where we drilled those zones at fairly shallow depths. You can see a pit there around it, tons that would be brought out in an open pit scenario. We did some drilling and we proved up mineralization in these zones. So we'll be able to put these zones straight into a Jork resource as we're doing at the moment. We're updating that Jork resource I expect it out to be the end of Q1, Q2 this year. Uh, I should say the start of Q2 this year. Um, and in terms of what we're looking at doing there, not only will we put these tons into it, but we'll also refresh the commodity prices that this analysis is done on. And this is a real opportunity for this deposit. The last time the resource was done here, the copper price used in that resource calculation was US $4,650 a tonne. So now trading at near on $9,000 a tonne, you know, there's a double the price for this resource and re-looking at redoing the resource here. Not only is the copper price inflated, but the molybdenum price, which comprises approximately 40% of the revenue out of this project, the molybdenum price at the time was in the mid $20,000 per tonne. Um, everyone's talking about rare earths, everyone's talking about lithium, no one's talking about molybdenum. Molybdenum this year, prices are up 100%, 100% in just six weeks. Kalman is the world's third highest grade undeveloped molybdenum project. The other one is in this region as well. It's owned by the Chinese. The second project is based in China. The third one is in a listed entity. So if anyone wants to do some research on molybdenum and is looking for exposure to a molybdenum project, I'd encourage you to have a good look at this particular project. In terms of what did we do in that drilling and what did that drilling hit, we put these results out on Monday and, you know, we've traded pretty flat this week, but when you start looking at the headline numbers of what we actually intercepted, you know, 89 metres at 1.74% copper equivalents of pretty good intercept, 24 metres at 5.1% within that interval, I think is pretty outstanding. Uh, 107 metres in another hole there at near on 1% copper equivalent, all within open pitable uh, material, um, will add to the deposit and the economics of the deposit. Whilst we've been exploring, we've been doing some work around Kelman. We've also been doing some technical work around ore sorting and the potential to uh, more efficiently pull these resources out of the ground. And that's something we've done during the year. We had some positive results from ore sorting test work. We're doing some more as we speak, uh, all in the aim of improving the economics and getting ourselves to put this project through a study. In terms of that extension to the north, not only are we extending it to the north, but you can also see another lens of mineralisation in the red there. That lens of mineralisation exists to the south of the deposit. It didn't exist to the north. It hadn't been tested. It hadn't been drilled. You can see our intercepts there, nice broad intercepts through those zones, again, adding more material to the Kalman deposit. Kalman gets me excited because it's a missed opportunity um, and it's a ready-made asset within our portfolio, easily to be valued um, and ready there to uh, go to the next stage of development. But, you know, the passion of Hammer and the team at Hammer is mineral discovery. 
Um, they've got a firm record of doing so. Ziggy and Russell with a Gruyere deposit. Um, we all know how that played out for Gold Road. Uh, the team have got many years of experience in Mount Isa. We're committed to trying to replicate that success in a copper setting. And just over the last 12 months, we've tested in excess of 15 different targets. A lot of these targets, you know, if you have a look in the brackets, so you'll see how many holes have been drilled at each of these targets. Mineral systems often found at hole 25, hole 30, hole 40, hole 50. Just over the last year, we've got six different prospects there that have all got less than 15 drill holes in them with some pretty good intercepts. Ajax, I was up here last year talking about Ajax. Uh, we've now followed that up. Our best hole there, 11 metres at 5%, just highlights the exceptional exploration potential within the Mount Isa district and within our portfolio. The other thing I'll mention is these targets actually span roughly 40 kilometres of our tenure. So if you think about that, we're finding copper across that entire 40 kilometre stretch. This is a district play, it is a district opportunity, and one day will be developed. At South Hope, we've only got four holes there. We're 600 metres away from Carnaby's Mount Hope uh, deposit. The four holes that we put in there, 25 metres at 2.4% copper. We have an EM target there that we're chasing, and we're about to start drilling at the end of February. At Mascot and Mascot Junction, approximately five kilometres to the east of the Mount Hope area, uh, we've put a single hole in at Mascot, six metres at 3.7% copper with some associated gold. Fantastic start to that particular prospect. And then Mascot Junction, uh, six metres at 2%. The interesting part about Mascot Junction, it was actually a hole that was drilled away from the old workings there that made that intercept, uh, which brings another zone of mineral, another zone of uh, prospectivity into the equation, that target. And just last week, we put out our results at the end of last year, the end of the drilling program, as the rig was leaving, we had a target sitting to the north of the highway in Cloncurry and in, in Mount Isa, um, in between Mount Isa and Cloncurry. We sent the drill rig there just before Christmas. We drilled a 180 metre hole there um, underneath an old deposit at Hardway and 30 metres at 1.1% for the first hole into that system. Uh, the nearest drilling to the north, 100 metres away, um, which was outside of a, an old working there, and then 500 metres to the south. And when I show you the geochemistry, I think there's a fair bit of potential there. Um, the interesting bit about Hardway, and it's caught us a little bit by surprise, is there's actually some rare earth mineralisation there. Um, you know, the grades at the moment are interesting. The mineralisation is quite unique in that it's the heavy rare earths. We're still trying to understand it. For the presentation, I'm still trying to learn how to pronounce some of these elements. Um, but, you know, it's an interesting geological system and it is a little bit different to what we've typically seen up there. When you have a look, I'll just draw your attention to the, sorry, the drill hole that we put in. You can see here underneath these old workings and people are going to ask me, well, you're just drilling underneath old workings, what's going on? Those old workings sat in a little mining lease that sat there for the best part of three decades. Uh, and relatively small scale uh, operations came in and they took out some reasonable grade ore. The records suggest it was 5%. But when they have these mining leases, it's typically a small scale operation. They don't do any exploration and they don't actually drill these targets. What can be done is a neighbouring exploration tenure. So you can see a single drill hole here to the north, 100 metres away, uh, and some to the south, 500 metres away. The other holes that can get drilled at the time, the actual main workings can never get drilled. So we're looking at a system here that hasn't been tested over 600 metres. You can see the copper soil anomaly here, stretches for that full 600 metres. You can see the workings on the screen, uh, very similar to what we've seen at Mount Hope and we've seen the results that Carnaby have achieved. We'll come in and we're going to drill this as part of our drilling program that commences at the end of this month. So it's fair to say we have quite a few targets to work through. The Mount Hope region, um, everyone's familiar with the Carnaby results out of this little uh, red mining lease that you can see here. Uh, there is a dispute. I'd encourage everyone to read the respective announcements about that dispute. Um, in terms of our tenure here, though, the tenure you can see, the lighter colours is 100% hammer-owned. Our South Hope prospect is just around here, around five, 600 metres south of the Mount Hope pit. We have a pretty interesting position in the area. And I spoke about the intercepts before, but Mascot and Mascot Junction sit out here, uh, approximately uh, five kilometres to the east there. So we have good tenure through this region, as we've seen there's some fantastic results uh, through this region. And we only started working down here approximately three to four months ago. So again, we'll further extend our drilling in this area. We'll continue to work this area up, but I think it offers tremendous upside for our shareholders. 
Uh, there's South Hope. Uh, I mentioned there the 25 metres at 2.4%. There's a downhole uh, EM anomaly there that we need to follow up and drill, and we will drill that as part of the upcoming program, but very early days at this prospect. Um, I'm sure everyone's spoken about a lithium projects and potential in our portfolio, but our Yandel package is predominantly gold, and we have spent time up there looking for gold. Um, it's been not a priority for the company or a focus as sat here in Western Australia. Uh, not really loved for the last 12 months, but we did do a soil survey about this time last year. Uh, we included lithium at the last minute on that soil survey. Um, we came back with some lithium anomalies. And what we found uh, was a couple of positive anomalies. And we went up and we did some field work um, and like many places, identified some pegmatites. The area that we found the pegmatites is really interesting in, you have Bellevue here, and we haven't even updated our map to show you where Kathleen Valley is, but Kathleen Valley just sits just north here. Uh, big granite system, the Kathleen Valley granite. If you follow that granite system to the other side of the granite, it's approximately 40 metres across and actually comes up against our portfolio at North Aurelia. The North Aurelia we've chased as a gold target for some time. We identified the pegmatites a few hundred metres to the west of where we'd been drilling. And we went in and we had a look at the um, downhole geochemistry. So when we've drilled here for gold, we've only analysed for gold over four metre intervals. Um, at the bottom of the hole, though, we have completed a full four acid digest and analysed for a broad suite of minerals. And what we've found at the bottom of these holes is that we have highly anomalous levels of lithium from 50 to 300 ppm. Uh, we've gone through, we've looked through the database, we've noted where we've uh, logged pegmatites in the drilling, but haven't sampled and haven't tested them. Uh, the pegmatites that we've identified on surface and sitting out to the east of where this drilling has been done uh, have the right mineral composition, the right, uh, uh, I learned something from, from uh, Ian earlier, um, it has the right chemistry to be the right part of the, the granite system. So they are fractionated granites here, the pegmatites look right, and there's some lithium anomalies. So We'll do an air core program here, most likely in Q2 this year and follow this up. It isn't a priority for us, but I think geologically it's very interesting. Um, looking on the other side of a granite that hasn't been tested or explored where you've got a world-class lithium deposit 40 kilometres away, I think makes some sense. What's coming up? I mentioned those drilling programs coming up. Um, I'm excited about the resource upgrade for Kelman. I think that could be a real differentiator for the company and make a significant difference as we look to advance from explorer to developer. Uh, we still have targets in Mount Isa that I haven't spoken to today. They're large scale IOCG targets and well suited to a potential JV moving forward. Um, there's lots of work to be done around that. We have new and exciting and emerging targets within the portfolio. Um, we're moving them along as rapidly as we did those targets last year. So not only will we test the targets that we have, we'll look to build on them this year and prove the potential within the Mount Isa Copper Province. Um, I didn't get a chance to touch on our JV. Um, don't just take my word for it. We've got JVs with Glencore and also Sumitomo Metal Mining over some of our exploration project areas. They're as excited by the region as we are and we're committed to building a copper company. Any questions, come and see me at the booth and thanks for your time today. <coughs> Joining us now is Talk Metals Managing Director, Christian Moreno. Uh, Talk is a Western Australian explorer with an experienced board and exciting gold projects in WA's high-grade gold fields. Talk's flagship Paris project has shown impressive high-grade results in its first five phases of drilling, including multiple new discoveries and the definition of a 2.5-kilometer Paris gold camp. Please welcome Christian Moreno. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christian Moreno, Managing Director of Torque Metals. And this morning, I'm going to explain you why Torque Metals is one of the best junior gold exploration companies in Western Australia. A little bit of disclaimer, this presentation was uploaded to the market this morning. And if you want to read it, you can download it. And it is important to mention that all exploration results within this presentation were previously released to the market. Let's go to the corporative structure. We got Patrick Berg, non-executive chairman. He is the executive chairman of Meteoric Resources. He's doing pretty well. Uh, he's got more than 20 years of experience in the ASX listed sector. Uh, his background lawyer. We got Tony Lofthouse with more than 30 years of experience in the banking and in the broking sector, as well as ASX listed sector. And his background is geology. 
And finally, we got Ian Finch, executive di non-executive director. Uh, he's got more than 50 years of experience in the exploration and resources uh, sector in Australia. And his, uh, his background is geology. And finally, Christian Moreno, geologist, engineer. Uh, I've got a specialization in structural geology, master degree in geophysics, and master degree in data science. Have got experience in the oil and gas sector, as well in the coal sector in Australia. Let's go straight away to the capital structure. We got uh, the share price is 16.5 cents as we speak. We got a market cap of 13 million. Uh, we got 1.5 million uh, cash in bank. We don't have any debts at all. But what is really important about this slide is the amount of shares that we got in our company. Just 77.8 million shares for this company. As soon as you see the Paris project, which is our flagship project, you will realize why this company can be massive. So we got two, two projects, one in Southern Cross, the Bullfinch project, and the other one in Paris. Paris is fantastic, it's our flagship project, and you realize why. Let's go to the Paris Gold project. We are located on the Boulder Lefroy Fault, uh, just 12 kilometers southeast from St. Dives. So if you go from the north, the Kalgoorlie Big Pit, and if you follow the Boulder Lefroy Fault, you are going to pass through St. Dives and then through Torque Metals. You see the size of our tenements is more or less 200 square kilometers. And if you see at the screen those yellow dots, they are representing grades above 10 gram per ton. So you can see that if you follow the border Lefroy fault, you will find gold, definitely. But it's not only that, we got nine mining licenses. So if we want to go to production right now, we can do this straight away. It's not only the size, but also nine mining licenses. Again, let's go back to the capital structure, just 77 million shares in issue, 200 square kilometers and nine mining licenses. But why the Paris project is so important, so interesting. We are exploring and we are the risking the Paris Gold Camp. We got three fantastic prospects here, the observation prospect, Triple H and Paris to the south. The distance between observation and Paris is 2.5 kilometers. And we got something in the middle as well. But please have a look on the grades. We got 39 meters at six gram per ton, 42 meters at two gram per ton, 27 meters at almost 11, 27 meters eight gram per ton, 24 at almost 11. And as you can see, we got high grade gold here. But it's not only high grade, it's shallow mineralization. Let's have a look to, to the depth. So we got 50 meters, 70 meters, 100 meters, and the potential to connect three different prospects and create something massive. Again, 77.8 million shares in issue. The distance, as I mentioned before, is 2.5 kilometers. And the idea is to keep exploring between these three different prospects and try to join all of them together. Can you imagine a massive gold project of 2.5 kilometers and one kilometer wide, that is uh, the Paris prospect at the moment? And if you consider the capital structure and if you consider the mining licenses that we got, it's very important. You have to have a look on the Paris project and torque metals. Let's go to the Paris prospect. So we got grades of uh, 15 at uh, 6 gram per ton, 39 meters at 6 gram per ton, 27 and 10, 27, 8, 24 at 10. So it's high grade gold. The structure is totally open to the west and in depth, and the size is one kilometer so far. So it's full of gold. This is not gold equivalent. This is 100% gold, it's nuggety gold, and it's ready to be produced. By the way, there is an historic peak over there. This historic peak uh, just, have, uh, just has 200 meters of strike length, and we managed to extend this, the structure up to 1,000 meters. But it is not only Paris, it's also Triple H. What is important about Triple H is shallow mineralization, high grade. So we got a strike north-south, 650 meters full of gold, and east-west, 450 meters. So we got the potential to have an open pit project here. And if we join these with Paris, we will have open pit and underground operations. But it is not only Paris, it is not only Triple H, it's also observation. So far, we got a structure of 500 meters, full of gold, totally full of gold, 
and it hasn't been produced. But by the way, look at the grades. Nine meters at 11, six meters at eight, four meters at 15. And it's not only the grades, 66 meters, 51 meters, 57 meters. So this company is going to join three different prospects and is going to create a massive gold camp. And you will see this very soon. This is the model that we are following. As you can see the magnetic image in the screen, we got observation to the north, Paris to the, to the south. The distance is 2.5 kilometers. We got one kilometer here, 650 meters here, 500 meters, uh, 500 meters here. We got some discoveries in the middle between Triple H and, and Paris. So that model that we are following is getting real. Can you imagine if we can join this and generate the Paris Gold Camp? What is going to be the share price of, the, of this company? Just with 77 million shares in issue. We, go, we are following these parallel structures, but also we believe that we can join uh, the parallel structures with perpendicular mineralized zones. And it is important to mention as well that it's not only observation Caruso and Paris, it is also Meniers Dam, it is also Marmarax, Strauss, and Paris South. We got gold in Paris South, we got gold in Strauss, we got gold in Marmarax, and we got 28 gram per ton uh, gold in Meniers Dam. This tenement, by the way, used to belong to Jindali and then passed to Sensor, and now we own 80% of the tenement. And by the way, the Paris project, we own 100%. This is the Strauss Prospect, it's the one located to the west. Uh, so far, I go 321 meters. It is shallow, shallow mineralization, but for us, it is um, it's not high grade. But what is not high grade for, for us is just 2 gram per ton, 3 gram per ton, and 4 gram per ton. If we got in Paris 10 gram per ton, 11 gram per ton, 29 gram per ton, and 45 gram per ton, well, we have to focus our, our drilling campaigns to Paris and leave this a little bit behind. But this year, we are going to drill this part of the, of the project. I don't like this slide. I rather prefer to say why you should invest in torque metals. Well, you have to understand and you have to consider four different points. The first one is you should invest in a company with high potential for significant gold resource. As you can see, we go 2.5 kilometers by one kilometer, high grade gold. What else do you want? We got a super experienced management team. We got Patrick Burke, we got Ian Finch, and we got Tony Lofthouse. We got the support for a fantastic broking house, and we got fantastic shareholders. So the team that Dark Metal has at the moment is amazing. We got the strong financial support. We got 1.5 million uh, cash in bank. We don't have any debts, and we are able to pay the two or three or three daily, uh, next drilling campaigns with this uh, budget. And finally, we got ideal market uh, conditions. We are heading into recession, and we are 100% gold. We don't want to uh, change our focus. Uh, if we find some pegmatite in our tenement, believe me, we are not going to uh, release that. We are 100% gold. Trust in this company, trust in the team, because this company is going to be different. This is the intended exploration program. The idea is to do five drilling campaigns this year, one campaign each two months, and the next drilling campaign is going to be in March, up to 7,000 meters of RC drilling, and one kilometer of diamond drilling. And the idea is to, yeah, to keep exploring, keep working in this company. Again, let's go back to the capital structure, James. 77.8 million shares in issue. The Paris Gold project, 2.5 kilometers by one kilometer. This is good. This could be massive. And this company is super healthy. Please follow us. Please join us in this journey. And the only thing that I can promise you is I'm going to work super hard in this company for take this company to the next level. After 10 minutes, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much for attending. <coughs> Thank you, Christian. Alto Metals is aggressively, aggressively exploring the sandstone gold project here in WA. With the rapidly growing shallow gold resource and significant regional potential, Alto's managing director, Matthew Bowles, joins us to tell us more about this exciting gold project. Welcome along, Matthew. Thanks, Jerry. It's, um, 
it's great to be here um, this year back at Fremantle and thanks to the RIU team for, for having me and being able to share the, share the Alto story. It's been a big year for, um, well, 2022 was a big year for us. We, um, we've got a, a major resource update on the horizon pretty soon. I'm going to talk about that. And um, I think the three things I'd like you to get out of today's presentation. So drilling, there's a lot more drilling happening. We've got a big resource update happening. And um, and also I think that we're going to talk about some um, potential new discoveries that sort of uh, some of the things we're working on. I'll just let you read the um, important notice on your on, in your own time. Um, the whole presentation, the extended version of the presentation is actually on the platform. Uh, we've got a few slides in here which aren't in this presentation, just goes in a little bit more detail. So um, so we're an advanced West Shining Gold Explorer. We're in the East Murchison WA, um, 740 square kilometres covering the majority, well, vast majority of the uh, sandstone greenstone belt. Sandstone's had a long history of mining. It's uh, already produced over 1.3 million ounces of gold. Um, so it's a great spot to be. And uh, we've got a really, really good big belt there. You can see the resource at the moment. Um, we announced at the beginning of last year a 93% increase in our resource to 635,000 ounces at 1.6 grams per tonne. Those resources, importantly, are all optimised. Um, so it's all open pitable. So it's um, open pitable gold. Um, there's a number of high grade hits that are outside that resource. Um, and uh, we undertook some sort of preliminary met work. Uh, we're getting up to 98% recovery. So just demonstrating there's going to be um, the gold could be liberated through a simple CIO process. So um, all, all the right things you want to see from an advanced explorer as it's growing its resources. We're well funded. We um, closed a capital raising in the last year. We, we've uh, got 4.4 in the bank as of December. Um, and we've got another big program uh, on underway, which we'll be starting in the next couple of weeks. So just quickly on the corporate side, um, share price is sitting about seven, seven point two cents. Market cap's about forty four, um, and uh, as I said, so EV of uh, cash of four point four, so um, an EV of about forty. Uh, I'd just like to highlight the um, the share price chart down the bottom there. So obviously we you can see we've been moving sideways for a little while. I think it's actually been holding up um, compared to a number of our peers very well, and I think it's very well primed for. Um, what we would expect to be a big uh, kick up in the up or uptick in the gold price and also with the resource update coming and some results we have coming through. Um, just quickly on the board, um, Mark Connolly, many, many of you will know Mark Connolly. Mark Connolly joined our board at the end of the last year. Um, so between myself, Mark and, and Richard Monty, we've got a, a big background in gold. We've uh, been involved in a number of developments. We've also been involved corporately as well on, a, on maximizing value for shareholders. Um, the team supported by a couple of key consultants, Ed Baltus, many of you may know, ex Goldfields, um, been involved in a number of discoveries along with Barry Bourne. So, you know, we've got a really good team, in addition to my exploration manager and the, the exploration in house exploration team that sort of, you know, they know what big discoveries look like. And it's the key thing you need when you're sort of exploring these big belts. So, just quickly, um, so last year, it was a, as I said, it was a great year for us. Um, we started off with a major resource update. Um, during the year, we completed 50,000 metres of drilling. Um, we planned to do 60, but we fell a bit short with um, with COVID and a bit of bit of weather. But um, you know, we've we've really got a bit of an uptick in the um, the amount of drilling we're doing, and we're finding by hitting these projects really hard is how you unlock that value. Um, and as you can see there from some of the the, the results, um, Lord Nelson will talk about that shortly. Um, we're getting some really thick, high grade mineral, uh, mineralization for Lords, um, and also Indomitable, which hasn't had any drilling really since about 2018, um, not at the level that we've hit it at. Um, and we're getting some really, really high grade shallow um, gold there. So that's really exciting. As I said, um, update coming uh, next month. And um, I'll talk about Arroyo as well, which um, is one of our regional targets. And we uh, undertook a, a maiden sort of program at Arroyo, which is the first time it's had any drilling in about 15 years. So this is a key, a key slide. And, I, you know, it just shows the pathway from um, our resource growth. And you'll see that those grey bars just highlight the... Um, the, the drilling that we completed in 2021 and then 2022, and you'll see there's a major uptick. And um, I think what this is just demonstrating is our resources are just limited by drilling. Um, the resources are open. They're open in all directions. They're open at depth. They'll keep going. Um, and you'll see that inset slide there shows um, ounces per vertical metre. I mean, most of our resource um, sits above 190 metres. As I said, it's all within open pits. Um, so we've put some obviously some basic metrics around that. Um, and it's a rust, robust resource, and that's what we're sort of focusing on. It's sort of, um, you know, this we use $2,500 gold price, so it's where, below where gold's currently trading. Um, so it's quite a, a conservative view, but uh, it's certainly a robust resource from what we can see at the moment. And, um, and we're planning this year to sort of replicate that level of drilling as well. So, again, hitting it hard because we want to keep driving this resource growth. Very quickly, um, 
So as you can see, the blue there, that, that's our tenant outline. It's 740 square kilometres. So it's a big project area covering the majority of that greenstone um, belt at sandstone. We're surrounded by a number of operating mills, multi-million multi ounce um, deposits. So it's a great spot to be. Um, infrastructure is fantastic. You've got the sandstone, um, uh, Agnew Sandstone, means, um, Mount Magnet Road that runs through the property. That's a sealed road. Um, you can fly out to the property on, um, well, charter flights or there's commercial flights out of Mount Magnet and Agnew. So it's a really easy spot to get to. Um, uh, and they're also building a, a, a gas pipeline down towards the, um, the southern end of that property as well. So there's certainly sort of a lot of support by a lot of key infrastructure. So the, um, this is a zoom in on, on the, on the, the um, our property I've built. And um, look, as I said, it's sandstone's had over, uh, it's had mining history since the early 1900s. And um, it's a very well-known project. Everyone's got their favourite sort of property um, or target there. Um, and there are multiple targets. Um, there's historic mines, there's a number of undeveloped um, deposits um, and there's some amazing structural targets. And sort of part of our challenge as a company has been how we prioritise all of those targets. Um, everyone's got a view. Um, we focus down in that, um, that southeast corner called the Alpha Domain for two reasons. Firstly, well, that's where all of our resources currently are. So it's a great place to start. Why would you leave gold to find gold? And the second part is, you know, there's some, there's some really sort of structural complexity down there, which, um, and that's what you want when you're looking for sort of big, big gold deposits. So here's a zoom in on the Alpha Domain. It's a 20 kilometre long gold corridor. It hosts all of our current resources. Um, and it's really sort of broken into three key areas. Um, you can see there, so this is um, uh, 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 Mag, Mag Interp. We've highlighted some of those key structures there, but you can see the rocks sort of on that eastern side, the Edale Shear. They're basically from the Lord's Corridor down there in the south uh, east of the, of the property. It's folding back up and creating that sort of 20, long, 20 kilometre long corridor. Um, and it hosts our entire um, resource base at the moment, basically between three camps, Lord's Camp, four, just over 400,000 ounces, Vanguard, which tripled at the beginning of the year from 50 to 150, and that's still open. And then Indomitable that I'll talk about that we've been drilling um, most of this year. So very quickly on the on the Lord's Corridor, it's a large granite diorite intrusion. It's pumped up, punched up between mafic and ultramafic rocks. We're seeing a lot of that high grade on the eastern side um, of the of the of the, of the granite diorite um, where that contact is. Um, and it, it hosts what was historically um, Lord Nelson mine, which was mined out um, from the oxide, and that fresh rock was left behind. We've we've grown that that um, key deposit to, to over two hundred and sixty thousand ounces. Um, the optimised pit now is now one point three kilometres long. Mineralisation is still plunging to the south there, so we can see that's going to continue growing. Lord Henry down in the south, one hundred thousand ounces there. There's a lot of mineralisation, as you can see here, outside that current optimised pit shell to the west. Um, and if you follow that tail all the way, all the way around, you've got um, Havilara and Meningamali, which, um, which we um, increased the resource on, on that. And then Havilara and Meningamali follow that corridor up to, to Vanguard. So Vanguard's part of that sort of um, 20K corridor. It's currently defined over two kilometres. Um, again, optimised pitch shores around this. It's very shallow. The pitch shores are only down to just over 100 metres. Vanguard North's um, very high grade. It's about 50,000 ounces there at just under four grams. Um, and that's completely open along, along that sort of corridor to the northwest. So um, very exciting for us and sort of something we we struggled with not going back and revisiting this year, but we wanted to go and hit um, uh, Indomitable, and I'll, and I'll show you why. Um, so this is an Indomitable, so we're about 15 k's away from the Lords um, itself. So, you know, within that sort of key hub area that we're focusing on. Um, and as you can see here, there's a, key, a couple of key structures running sort of um, northwest and then sort of running sort of more so north-south. North um, and it's intercut by um, the stratigraphy, which is some sort of banded iron formations. And you're getting around that, just around this area here. I'm going to work my laser. Great spot right there, sort of in that sort of fold closure around the nose. Um, there's a lot of sort of, you know, broken up structural complexity there. And, um, and you're seeing a lot of that, that gold coming through. So, oh, just jump. so this is how Indomitable looked uh, at the beginning of the year. We hit, hit Indomitable really hard. It's about 37,000 metres of drilling. Um, and this is how Indomitable is looking now. So we've extended it. It's over two and a half kilometres um, of mineralisation. We've, um, you'll see down there in the southeast, sorry, southwest corner, uh, Musketeer. Um, we're going to put a maiden resource on Musketeer um, in the coming weeks. Um, so there's obviously no, that's not currently included in the resource. Again, um, Indomitable East out there, there's no uh, resource on that. And we're looking to put a maiden resource on, on um on Indomitable East. 
And we focus a lot of our drilling um, on that gap between Indomitable and Indomitable North, um, given that there's two sort of small optimised pits on those, and we really wanted to try and, try and consolidate, that, that, consolidate that into one much larger pit, and we seem to have done that, which is, which is looking pretty exciting from the drilling there. Wait to see um, with the resource coming out. And the other key thing is we, we undertook some big step out holes. So it wasn't really just about lots of safe drilling to incrementally grow resources. Um, I said these resources will continue to grow, but we did some big step out, sort of 80, 100 meter, 160 metre step out holes. And we've extended that mineralisation um, to the north further, um, over 500 metres. So there's, I mean, a lot of that mineralisation won't come into this updated resource given the, the spacing, um, but it just demonstrates that this thing is getting a lot bigger. It's open in all directions. We had some amazing um, high grade hits, 25 metres at seven grams from 40, 80 metres at sort of 1.6 from 21 metres. So you know, there's a lot of gold still left in that, in that system. And you, this is the looking at Indomitable um, through a long section here. I think the two things you'll, you'll highlight, you'll see those pit shells, which are the historic ones from 2018 based on $2,000 gold. Um, you can see there's a lot of mineralisation outside of that. The other key thing is um, there's no real drilling below 200 metres, so this is still very, very shallow. We're looking at sort of like doing some deeper drilling to sort of target those high-grade structures. And the, in some areas, the, the oxidisation is down to 190 metres, which is great when you're sort of talking about mining, but where we are at the moment, it's pretty hard from a geology point of view. So um, it's certainly got some pros and cons, but sort of I can see, um, well, we can all see Indomitable potentially growing a lot bigger than it currently is. So very quickly, I wanted to talk on one of our regional targets. And I guess um, since I've been involved with the company, we've really been focusing on that alpha domain, not wanting to get distracted by all the other targets that are there. And, you know, we are in that enviable position that we've got some fantastic gold targets within the broader portfolio. Um, and it has been a bit of a struggle. As I said, everyone's got their favourite, why aren't you looking here? Um, and this is just one example of, I guess, the quality of the projects within our portfolio. So Hacks and Arroyo are two, um, well, two historic mines. They were um, some of the highest grade gold mines in Australia at the time. They were both mined during the, mainly during mine the um, early 1900s. Um, they both produced over 200,000 ounces at sort of 16 and 24 grams per tonne. So you can understand why a lot of people had the view that we should be going back and having a look at these. Um, and it was, it, it's certainly very tantalising. We've started to have a look now. We've got some more data. Initially, we've taken a, a much bigger picture point of view. So um, we're over on the sort of more so on the western side of the property. Um, you've got the big UME shear running down the western side, and you'll see there both Hax and Arroyo, uh, two north-south um, striking reefs, um, you and me further to the west, and you've got this four-kilometre, I guess, gap there. And so this image, we've just high, um, showed sort of max gold. We've overlaid some of the key structural interp, and all of that gold is a lot of the historical workings. I think for me, a couple of the key things that jump out from just this image is um, the complete lack of drilling in that area. Um, and certainly the number of high grade or sort of uh, historical workings. And these guys would have been going down chasing Bonanza Gold. Um, and there's a lot of, what we see this is a potential new area. Um, not only looking at things like Arroyo and, and Hacks, sort of can we extend the mineralization there? But, you know, can we find a repeat reef? Um, as said, sort of, you know, hasn't had a lot of drilling. We're in a you know, different uh, gold price environment. We can go and hit these things hard. And so that's going to be part of our regional side. Um, which is quite exciting, but it's certainly not losing focus from the alpha domain. And here's an example of Arroyo. Um, we've overlaid, so um, plan view, and you're looking at the the, um, the open pit there, which Herald mined in the early 1900s. They put an uh, open cut, went down to about 60 metres on top of the, um, the underground workings. But all of those drill results uh, are all unmined. So they were drilled after the um, old timers went in there, and I said they were chasing that bonanza um, grade. But some of the remnant mineralisation is um, it's pretty exciting for us. And so you can see why it's been such a tantalising target to go and look at. Um, we undertook a very small program at the, at the end of last year and we announced the results um, beginning of this week. It was only 2,000 metres and it was really sort of to test a couple of geological models, how that mineralisation does it extend um, further to the northwest and we've confirmed that it does. Um, there's the unmined um, Juno reef that sort of sits to the west there, sort of as that reef's dipping down. And then also sort of Arroyo West. There's a lot of targets to follow up um, and we're planning on drilling that shortly. So how does 2023 look for Alto? Um, a lot more drilling. Um, we're just, we're unlocking the value of this and it is happening through drilling. Um, it's getting a lot of smart people um, in our camp, uh, some new ideas coming through and how we can unlock this as rapidly as possible. Um, I've got a major resource update coming out next month. 
a lot more drilling. The rig's going to be back on site. They're either, be, depending on permitting, we'll be going straight back to Arroyo um, or we're going out to follow up on some of those 25 gram, I'm sorry, 25 metre hits at um, at Indomitable um, and then just more drilling throughout the whole year instead of a lot more news flow. So um, I think that's a key thing. I'm getting flashed at, Jerry. So I think I'm all done. Thank you. <coughs> Now, the side of the auditorium is starting to look like last mass uh, before the pubs open. And there's, there's plenty of room around the auditorium if you'd like to uh, find a seat. Dreadnought Resources is a WA mineral explorer focused on discovering the minerals of our future. Managing Director Dean Tuck joins us to give us an example, sorry, to give us an update on exploration across its portfolio of critical metal projects. Please welcome Dean Tuck. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for being here. Got uh, two thing my jiggers to check today. Going to see if we, uh, hopefully I don't embarrass myself too much uh, trying to walk around here on stage. But uh, thank you all for being here. It's a, it's a privilege to be up here today at RIU presenting again for our third time, just before the slot before DeGray, another fantastic WA exploration success story. It's uh, fantastic to see a full audience. Got quite a bit of the team here, so please come by and see our booth after the presentation and see some of the rocks that we have on display. Our disclaimers getting longer and longer. Um, don't know how it fits on one page anymore. So as I said previously, this is my third time to present at RIU. Last year, we said, closed off by saying, buckle up. We were four cents, 100 mil market cap presenting today. We hit 15 cents last year on the back of multiple rare earth discoveries. We we're sitting around nine to 10 cents at the moment, 300 mil market cap. The first time I presented here at RAU two years ago, we were 1.7 cents. We delivered the Orion discovery that year in Metzke's. And when we listed only three, four years ago, we were only 0.3% of a cent of the three to five mil market cap. Dreadnought has, in the past three to five years, delivered hundreds of millions of dollars of shareholder value. And we have done that on the back of delivering discoveries, exploration being one of the hardest working teams on the ASX. And I'm looking forward to talking to you today about what we have in front of us, because I think we have the most exciting years yet coming in 2023. Mangaroon Project, this is what's driving our success at the moment. People forget that we were a 50 to 100 mil market cap before we had the rare earths. Well, we got to 300 mil, 350 mil on the back of the rare earths discoveries we've made at Mangaroon. Next door to Hastings, Yangabana Operation, the next up and coming rare earths uh, developer here in Western Australia. And we have a fantastic opportunity. We believe we have found the other half of those Yangabana ironstones. And we have also found the source carbonatite intrusions for that region, which I'll talk a bit more about. But that's all part of a, a 5,000 square kilometer project, which is one of our four company scale projects that we have in our portfolio. And uh, we have quite a bit of other potential on that Mangaroon project, first quantum exploring for us at, on the nickel copper PGEs, and we're building up the gold portfolio in the background. But the vast majority of my talk today is going to be about the rare earths. That is 80% of our focus this year. Our time, our effort, our people, and our money are going towards delivering the rare earths. December last year, we delivered our first resource over the Yin Ironstone, over just three kilometers of what we have defined as 43 strike kilometers of ironstone mineralization. We delivered that in less than six months from drilling the first hole into Yin, only a year after discovering the ironstones at Yin, stumping over and identifying these ironstones extend across the Lions River Fault. We have a fantastic understanding of the mineralization. We have the same high NDPR to trio ratios as Hastings, some of the most unique and highest in the world, creating a very high value monazite concentrate. We have mineralogy confirmed in that resource already because thanks to Hastings and having a second mover advantage, as I often say, we're probably the only rare earth explorer with a second mover advantage, de-risking the key processing and metallurgical properties of this mineralization. Before we drilled a hole, we were able to take the Hastings flow sheet and produce a 40% monazite con, 93% mass recovery. There are no other rare earth projects in the world that come close to the metallurgical recoveries as the Gifford Creek ferrocarbonatite complex seen at Hastings and seeing what we're seeing here at Dreadnought as well. Importantly as well for that resource, 
not only is there the, the bulk tonnage at similar grades and NDPR ratio as Hastings, we also have higher grade components within that. As we step back and look at this region, the Gascoigne region, the work being done by Hastings, Lanthanide, Kingfisher, us on the rare earth space. You have red dirt down at Yenithera Melinda, which our, our team's very familiar with, and the voltaic guys as well. What you're seeing and what we believe we are seeing is the Gascoigne region developing into the Pilbara of critical metals for Western Australia. The rare earth province, the Gifford Creek Farrakabantite complex here, Hastings put out an exploration target this year, 40 to 60 million tons on top of their 30 million tons of resource. We put out an exploration target of 50 to 100 million tons on top of our 15 million ton, 14 million ton resource. What we're seeing here is a long life, potentially 100 plus year life changing operation that can provide the world with high quality, high NDPR ratio monazite concentrate to the world to help that EV transition. It's a fantastic opportunity, not only for us and for Hastings and for the region, but also Western Australia and Australia to secure a supplies chain for rare earths uh, right here in our own backyard. These exploration targets, importantly, that's only the top 150 meters. The thicknesses and grades we've seen at, at, at Yen and that initial resource, we believe there could be underground potential on that. These things are magmatic dikes. These things should not cease to exist as they continue to go down at depth. These things should have significant depth extent. We're doing work on that at the moment see if that does actually have economic potential as an underground mine. And then if it does, we will be drilling that deep and we will show that this thing extends to depth. And we also have the gabonatites, which I'll talk about in a second. So what we see here in the Gifford Creek Farragabonatite complex, you have the Hastings ironstones, you have the dreadnought ironstones. And we believe that there is, well, Hastings is building a mine. We're going to deliver the resources in the next six to nine months to form the foundations of study work to build a mine to produce a monazite concentrate here in Western Australia, here at this project. And we'll deliver those resources, 30 to 50 million tons is our target. And we will do commence study work on that by the end of this year. Once we start that study work, we'll then continue to add resources on the ironstones. Running in parallel to the ironstones, which have been de-risked thanks to Hastings, we will be exploring and continue to explore the carbonatite intrusions of this region. Significant upside scale potential. The ironstones are there. But these, these carbonatite intrusions, since Newmont was out here in the 1990s, Hastings has been looking for these as well. They were sitting on the Lions River Fault. And we have already confirmed we drilled 90 holes at the end of last year. We're only a third to halfway through testing the C1 to C5 carbonatite targets. We packed up shop for Christmas, and uh, we will be continuing that first pass program. But despite that, those first 90 holes identified six regions of mineralization within the carbonatites to date. And we've only just started on that quite thick mineralization. We have the residual mineralization seen at places like Mount Weld and Arasha, and we'll continue to assess. We have 3,000 samples at the lab at the moment. We have a steady flow of news coming on the back of those drill results that we put out last year, that uh, we drilled last year. And then beyond C1 to C5, we also have C6. C6 is on the next crustal scale structure down. This has a very similar um, geophysical signature to Mount Well to Nagual. It's more of the classic large, high mag, high grav sort of uh, carbonatite target. I was up there with the native title group, the Thin Ma, four days before Christmas, walking 12Ks across C6, uh, all undercover. We're looking forward to drilling that, but we have approvals in place now. We will be drilling this here in the next couple of weeks, and we are very, very excited to not only continue to deliver discoveries and resources on the ironstones, but also assess the C1 to C5 carbonatites and to the C6 carbonatites all this year in the coming months. So what does that say for us? Ironstone framework drilling. We have 43 strike kilometers of ironstone. We've drilled out three. We're gonna find out where within that 43 strike kilometers is the best place to start building uh, a core resource base to start converting for study work. So where within that 43 strike kilometers do we want to double or triple our current resource? By the way, that resource we delivered with six weeks of drilling with assay results delivered in a resource put out in six months. These aren't a big Hemi discoveries. These aren't big Julemars. These aren't big Gruyers. These don't take 14 rigs a year and a half to drill out. We did that with one rig in six weeks of drilling. And we will continue to be able to keep that pace up. In May, once we get back the metallurgical test work results in our QAQC, we'll put out a resource upgrade on Yin. And with the drilling that we'll be commencing this weekend, we will be 
delivering the ironstone extension resource work by September quarter. And the carbonatites will be running, being tested in tandem as we'll have three to four rigs on site. So that's the ironstones, that's the rare earths, that's what's been driving us our success to date. As I alluded to before, we have delivered a lot of shareholder value on the back of making discoveries. And I wanna make two statements that I believe that everyone in this room would not disagree with. First off, discoveries are made by teams. And Dreadnought has one of the best discovery teams that has ever been assembled in my, in my memory. I love my team and we've delivered. Like Scotty there on the end, we're the mailman. We always deliver what we say we're going to deliver. Second statement is mines are built by teams. And at the moment, we're on the embarking on discovering a potentially globally significant rare earth province. And with that comes the ability to attract some top tier people to deliver that mine. So over the next six to 12 months, while our team is delivering additional discoveries and resources at Mangaroon, we will be recruiting the team to develop that mine to make sure it's done in the best interest of dreadnought shareholders to deliver the value and create the concentrate that we can produce here in Western Australia for supply chains. And while that's being built and when our team is done delivering those discoveries and resources and we've built the team to lead the study work and the development, our team will continue to be advancing our four other project scale, potentially life-changing company making projects. And what does that look like for us this year? Mangaroon Gold, there's a lot of people expecting the gold to come through this year. We're no different. We originally pegged Mangaroon for the nickel and the gold. First Quantum's drilling out there this year. They'll be continuing to test the nickel. But Scott, uh, not Scott, uh, Sam Bassetti has been sitting down with all the old prospectors, the station owners, the people who have worked out at Star of Mangaroon, the Mangaroon Gold Province before, a region that produced gold at ounces to the ton. And we're amassing for the first time all of the locations that gold has been produced and never been drilled. We've identified a 14 kilometer long gold trend where thousands of ounces have been produced and not a single drill hole into it. So we'll be preparing to deliver those gold discoveries this year while we're delivering the rare earths. Taraji Yampi in 2021, we delivered the Orion copper, silver, gold, cobalt discovery. The last year, it sort of fell behind and people forgot about it. That is what drove us to 100 mil market cap in the first place. And we've been working feverishly to find Orion's friends. We see that as an Avanco style opportunity, the ability to identify a camp of high grade copper deposits here in Western Australia, a style of mineralization not seen in Western Australia before, but very similar to Clon Curry in the Mount Isa district. We'll be up there. We've identified a number of Orion lookalikes with the geochemistry, the Gossens sticking out of the ground, and the EM plates sitting there ready to be drilled. So we will be decide, we'll be making and delivering those drill programs this year in the Kimberley come July and see if we can't show the scale opportunity in the Kimberley. Bresnahan, our newest project off the ranks, taking the fantastic work done by Northern Minerals, George Bach, um, you know, Carl, and all the guys that developed the unconformity heavy wear earth model. And we've deployed that to identify a new, potentially new province. And just last year, um, we spent a couple of days proving the concept that there are heavy rare earths. We got rock ships the exact same grade as Wolverine. And this year, with that proof of concept in place, we will be going out there and defining drill targets along the 300 strike kilometers of perspective structures that we have in this 4,000 kilometer land package that we dominantly pegged as open vacant ground to explore for rare earths and gold and silver and antinomies similar to Black Cat's Paulson's operation down the road. Very exciting, could turn into nothing. It's exploration, but it's a new province, it's new exploration, it's opening new search base and that's how big discoveries are made. And Central Yogarn, the last one I talk about, what company wouldn't dream of having 150 strike kilometers of greenstone belts that's underexplored, and we still do. And we're going to be advancing that. We're working with Nuexco. We're going to be defining and generating nickel targets with Nuexco to see if these belts have similarities to Forestania Lake Johnson. We'll be delivering those, those targets and drilling those by the end of this year or ready for next year, in addition to the gold targets that our team generated out there previously. Takeaway message, Dreadnought is a 300 mil market cap. Maybe we're a mid-tier now. We're a mid-tier 
explore multi-commodity, lots of exposure to the critical metals needed for the future. We have the team in place to deliver those discoveries. And we have the team in place now to deliver the resource upgrades to commence study work on the rare earths and recruit the team that's going to help deliver that production. And that photo right there that was sent to me last night, that is the drill rig ready to go at Yen South. Drilling will commence this Saturday. So buckle up once again, because Trenauts is fully funded with all approvals and all targets in place for the first time in our history. We have 20, over 20 mil in the bank. We have targets galore in front of us. We have all approvals in place. We're going to line them up and drill them down and see what the drill bit has to say. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dean. One more before we go to morning tea. DeGray Mining has made one of the largest gold discoveries in Australia for decades. And it's moving towards an investment decision on its Melina project this year. The Gray's general manager exploration, Phil Tornatora, is with us to provide a brief update on the project's development progress, but he'll focus on the company's latest exploration activities designed to achieve new large-scale discoveries and further resource growth. Please welcome Phil Tornatora. <clears throat> thank you for that introduction and um, thank you to the organisers of RIU for the opportunity for De Grey to present here again this year. It's good to see um, De Grey's um, HEMI project or images of the project featuring on, on the front cover of your programs and posters around uh, the conference here. Um, I'll make it, be making some forward-looking statements, so there's some disclaimers on the website that you can read. De Grey's tenement package covers uh, quite a number of native title groups, so we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we operate, the Garriera, Nyala, Manyamal, Nyala and Malana peoples, and um, we pay our respects to all members of their Indigenous communities. I'd also like to acknowledge the De Grey team, the exploration team in particular. So we've drilled over a million metres now since the discovery of HEMI. So it's been a, a huge effort by, by all the um, people on the ground, our contractors, service providers, and also the, um, it's great to have the support of the board as well. Malina is a new Australian gold province. It's in an Archean setting in the Pilbara Craton of Western Australia, around 85 kilometres south of Port Hedland. It's um, similar age and style of mineralisation to the 200 million plus Yilgarn Craton further south. So De Grey holds a strategically significant 1,500 kilometre squared land position in, in the, in the um, Pilbara Craton. And we discovered a large high value intrusion hosted style of gold deposit at HEMI, uh, firstly with air core drilling in late 2019. And we followed that up with um, RC and diamond drilling in early 2020. So for a lot of the deposits there has been less than three years since their discovery. We upgraded the HEMI mineral resource to eight and a half million ounces in May last year. And the Malina gold project resources now totals 10.6 million ounces. Uh, the maiden Hemi, Hemi resource grew at 450,000 ounces per month. Um, so when you get onto one of these intrusion hosted deposits, you can add a lot of ounces very quickly. We put out a pre-feasibility study later last year, and that's further improved the key metrics of what's a financially attractive and technically viable tier one global development project. And with that, we released the maiden oil reserve of 5.1 million ounces at 1.5 grams per tonne. That only includes HEMI in that reserve, so we're looking to add some of the regional deposits to that going forwards. So the project really does have a tier one production profile, average uh, annual production of 540,000 ounces over the first 10 years, with total production of around 6.4 million ounces at this stage, and that would place, place us well within one of the future top five Australian gold mines in terms of production. Uh, I won't say too much more on the PFS in this presentation. It's really more focused on exploration, but um, you can read more on our on our press releases. And um, at the booth, we've got a video with a 3D depiction of the 
of the ore bodies as well as the proposed plant inf and infrastructure, et cetera. So if you drop by our, by our booth, you can see that and ask any questions that, that you'd like. So where is the grey today? Uh, as I mentioned, we've completed that pre-feasibility study and that confirms a technically and financially compelling project. We recently announced signing of a mining agreement with the Garriara people, and that covers HEMI, uh, the project infrastructure, and most of the regional deposits. So that was a key milestone in progressing our approvals. We've submitted mining lease applications for HEMI and regional deposits, and they should be well advanced at this stage. We've done a lot of technical de-risking, so that's continuing pilot style scale metallurgical test work and optimization. The infill drilling to support the DFS is pretty much completed. We've only got a bit more QAQC and twin holes to drill, and um, then we'll really focus more on exploration going forwards. And the project finance approval process uh, has is advancing with strong interest from potential debt providers. And where are we heading? Looking at completing the DFS mid this year, advancing the project approvals process with a focus on environmental and other statutory permitting. Uh, we're looking to bed down the project funding strategy by mid this year and using the DFS to support the final investment decision and then order long lead time items. We're continuing to build the organisational capability and this is really to build the internal capacity for Degray to take the project through to development and production. And at the same time, we'll be continuing exploration, targeting mainly the discovery of shallow large resources and exploration is the main topic of this talk today. So some of the highlights from last year, as I mentioned, um, we had a significant upgrade to the Hemi resource, it increased 25% or 1.7 million ounces to the current eight and a half million ounces. We uh, increased the Hemi uh, Jork indicated resource by 3 million ounces, so a huge increase in the indicator there to 5.8 million ounces, and that underpins the, the uh, maiden ore reserve of over 5 million ounces. A lot of the drilling was focused on, on this infill and other technical work uh, for metallurgic and geotech, et cetera, but at the same time, we did identify um, mineralized extensions to a number of the zones, including Duke on an Eagle, and, uh, and also um, that was including some high grade zones as well. Uh, we've got some great intersections, which I'll go through in a bit more detail in the presentation. We also confirmed thick and consistently mineralized intrusion in infill drilling and down plunge at Brolga, and that's still open at depth as well. Outside of Hemi, we confirmed anomalism over two kilometers in Air Corps and first pass RC drilling at several prospects, including Antwerp, which is just to the west of Eagle. Uh, we defined over 800 metres of strike and mineralised intrusion at Charity Well, and this remains open and undrilled to the east. And uh, we recently announced discovery of some southern loads at Withnall, and we're planning to start resource drilling there very shortly. So on the current metrics, we clearly have a great project and people say, well, why do you need to continue exploration? But um, some of the drivers for, for ongoing exploration include the fact that we recognise the majority of the 150 kilometre long belt outside of Hemi has seen very limited exploration, particularly with drilling. And uh, with the discovery of Hemi, we've got the ability to, to apply some of the discovery lessons to increase our chance of success going forwards and geological studies into stratigraphy, structure, geochem, and geophysics are, are ongoing. Um, this slide here, oops. This slide shows some of, um, uh, around 14 sea containers we've got full of um, pulps from all the previous drilling at HEMI, uh, sorry, at, at the, across the project. So we're looking to sort through them and we'll be um, analyzing selected samples out of that for multi-elements. And it's really to help improve our understanding of geology and better target our exploration going forwards. Um, Al Nishaw reckons there's at least one ore body hiding in these sea containers. Um, we've seen potential for large deposits to exist beneath some areas that show fairly, fairly low level anomalism. And I'll show some examples of that going forwards. So really any resource additions that we do make can enhance the project 
economics after plant debottlenecking from either higher throughput or higher feed grade displacing lower grade ore. So the aim is really to continue to add value to the project through the construction and commissioning phases. So I'll run through some of the exploration potential at our Malina project, um, starting with HEMI. So at HEMI, we've defined eight and a half million ounces in less than three years. And um, when you look at some of the larger Archean deposits in the Eastern gold fields, they took decades to achieve this scale. So, so we believe it's really early days at HEMI. Most of the deposits, are, or all of the deposits are open at depth and uh, many of them are long strike as well. Um, one example of that is at Jukon. This is now a 1.6 million ounce resource and we've put out some major intersections over 200 metres beneath the May resource. This includes 359 metres at 1.2 in HEDD 128, um, 75 at 1 and 72 at 1 1.4 in hole 136. These are reported at fairly low cutoff grades um, using higher cutoffs. They include some much higher grade intervals, including 19 at seven, two at 22, et cetera. Uh, this is what some of that higher grade mineralization looks like. So um, visible gold in smoky quartz veins. Um, our principal technical geologist, Richard Beckley has been working with a team and consultants and it's really, um, um, emphasising the importance of structure at HEMI, particularly Jukon and Eagle. The, the intrusive is a great host rock, but, but um, structure is very important there. It's something we haven't really appreciated um, up till now. And when you look at other Archean load style structural deposits, they have a significant vertical extent. So we think there's a, a lot of potential for deeper underground style mineralisation at HEMI as well. We've only just started looking at some of that with, with some of this very wide space, deeper drilling. I mentioned that we can get um, some very good mineralization beneath either weak anomalism or meta sediments. Um, and this is an example from Eagle. I showed it in a new gen conference a couple of years ago, but it's, I think it's worth showing again. So original air core that was drilled by De Grey way back in 2006, 2007, well before HEMI was discovered. Um, back then we actually drilled a, a fence of air core holes over the top of, of um, the Eagle deposit. And the, but the two holes over the intrusive failed to penetrate to the bedrock through the transport recovery because there there's a layer of pebbles that's difficult to drill through. Um, so they actually missed it at, the, at that stage. This is what that cross section looks like now. So intersections such as 16 at 2.8, 19 at 11, in some cases within metres of the base of those air core holes. But even more recently, um, 2020, this is a fence of air core holes drilled straight over the guts of the Duke on ore body. The best results out of that over the intrusive were, were 18 at 0.2. So that's what that section looks like now. Some fantastic hits, 63 at four, 56 at two, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we, we can see that you can get some very good mineralization beneath some fairly low level geochem. And I'm not, not saying every low level geochem anomaly has a Jukon sitting underneath it, but it does provide a lot of encouragement for uh, other areas around HEMI where we get a lot of this, this sort of thing, particularly in areas where we see the right geology and the right style of mineralization and alteration. The other thing to point out at Jukon is, is that it's got a, below the transported cover, the surface footprint is actually quite small. So most of those 1.6 million ounces sit in an area of around 300 by 350 metres. So underneath 30 or 40 metres of transported cover, they can be quite hard to find some of these deposits. Uh, stepping outside of HEMI, um, we've got some very good results from this Antwerp area here. So it just sits just west of um, Eagle and Jukon, uh, some higher grade air core and also some good first pass RC, six at five, six at four, 25 at one. So this is an area we'll be getting out and um, doing some follow up work very shortly. We've also uh, have similar scale antenna targets at, at Brolga South, um, Cray North and extending up into Scooby as well. So a lot of, a lot of um, good targets to follow up in the, just around HEMI itself. And then stepping back, we've got around 10 kilometre corridor of um, significant multi-element and gold anomalies, which, which uh, all require RC and diamond follow-up. Uh, there's numerous 
intrusive styling tar targets in that corridor. Stepping out again in scale, um, this Greater Hemi corridor is, is really a focus, um, but outside of that, we've got targets such as this MBP target around 15 kilometres of strike. It's more of a structurally controlled target, but, but we do see potential for intrusives in there as well. And this area, 15 kilometres of strike, doesn't have a single drill hole into the whole area, and it's within about 10 kilometres of an 8 million ounce ore body. So a great deal of potential for the regional targets as well. So I've really been just looking at this um, area in here, and um, we've obviously got 150 kilometres of strike of this, these um, major structural corridors. So I'll show some other examples that from Withnell and uh, way out to the west at um, Charity Well here as well of our, of our exploration targets. At Withnell, we've just recently announced discovery of some um, southern loads there. So we're going to, um, yeah, with some, some pretty good intersections, 20 at 1.6, 9 at 4. So we'd, we'd be getting out there very shortly and um, drilling, drilling that out to try and add to the resource with, with obvious implications for the, for the pit at Withnell. We also recently drilled a metallurgical hole there at, at Withnell, and this was deliberately designed to be drilled down plunge to provide as much metallurgical core as possible, but we we're still pleasantly surprised by that intersection, nearly 156 metres at 2.3. So it just shows the, um, the potential upside in some of these regional deposits outside of HEMI as well. Um, Charity Well, uh, further to the west, is one of our higher priority regional targets. It's just north of our half a million ounce Tarana deposit. So we've been able to access this western portion here, um, and we've got some, some pretty good RC intersections out there, 18 at 1.5, 6, 6 at 2.8, et cetera. Um, we haven't been able to access this eastern portion to date, but because it's uh, held by a different Aboriginal group, but we've just recently completed heritage surveys there and we'll be getting out there um, very shortly to follow that up. Again, some, some really good intrusive targets and not a single drill hole in, into that area. So as, as you can see, we've got a fantastic pipeline of projects. This, this just shows some of the higher priority projects um, all the way through from early stage conceptual through to reserve definition. And we're, we're aiming to add um, Tarana and Withnell to the uh, reserves later this year. So just to sum up, uh, we can see there's significant upside to the PFS through resource growth. Any resource additions have the potential to improve economics through either higher grade or longer mine life. While the focus is on discovery of shallow intrusion hosted large gold deposits, we see a, a lot of upside for the future with high grain underground as well. And the plan is to continue exploration through the mining studies and construction phase to add further value. Thanks for your attention. Time now for morning tea, and uh, we are back at 11.15. Hi, my name is Brad Gurry and I'm the CEO of Social Suite. Social Suite is an environmental, social and corporate governance reporting platform, ESG. We're proud to be supporters of the RIU conference. And I'd firstly like to start by congratulating Social Suite customers that are here presenting throughout the duration of the conference. Black Canyon, Coda Minerals, Gallon Lithium, Galileo Mining, Helix Resources, International Graphite and Nordic Nickel. These companies along with 80 ASX micro to small caps understand the importance of ESG to create long-term organizational value. The Social Suite platform is specifically designed for micro to small caps in supporting them, one, to attract capital from investors that value ESG disclosures, two, creating revenue through responding to supply chain requests and the negotiation of offtake agreements. Three, mitigating organizational risks while building brand value. The Social Suite platform is easy and affordable for the smallest of organizations to get started with ESG. This is complemented by our industry expert ESG coaches who will help you with your ESG journey. We wish all companies and investors a successful 
RIU conference and we're here to help with your ESG needs.